grateful that we have a live microphone that will pick up all conversations. So team one, you guys have the floor, good luck. Hello all and good morning. Welcome to the Marlins Business Conference. Today, I'd like to start your days off right by giving you the one group you'll need to look at all day. We are Divine Consulting. I'd like to introduce each and one of our team members. Starting with Atsuko, Stefan, Josue, Maizea, and to introduce himself and our mission statement. And my name is Brady. Hello, my name is Christian. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about our goal and mission statement. So our goal is to provide reliable, innovative technology solutions that help clients achieve their goals. Be a trusted partner with superior value through expertise, responsiveness, and quality commitment. But we will continue to empower, we will continue to empower success with expertise. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about our layout overview. So our long-term goals. Our goal is to attract more customers to the store. Uh, that's always the number one thing that we look for when we're trying to sell items. Um, next, we will try to have more affordable prices for the students, and that will always be an incentive for us in you know, buying first products. Next, we will add new technology renovations. Uh, you know, we have to always keep up with technology standards as we go on in time, and that's always a good thing to keep keep the uh, store looking friendly. Next, we're going to go into how we're going to improve. We're going to improve as an eco-friendly business by implementing different eco-friendly technologies or anything that we can implement into the store that we can use. Um, next, we're going to promote a more inclusive and inviting area to where students can feel relaxed and comfortable in their space that they're in. Next, we're going to go into the remodel, and now I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Josue, to go into it. Hello. Um, so for our layout overview, what we're mainly looking for, as what Chris said in the previous slide, is that we're looking for a new innovation of technology in an eco-friendly type base. So for our our main of uh, our main body for our layout is to is to remove a uh, remove a middle register to have a more open space that we could sell more products and so and have more uh, more of like eco furniture friendly stuff around. Um, what we want to do is make all make the wood uh, make the floor uh, all wood, so it could be more all of it just more all of it could be all connected and. And uh, as you see in the bottom bottom left, there's a there's a little sheet of all the layout of all the furniture products that we're hoping that we're uh, hoping to get for our um, business. And the prices range from approximately seven thousand to nine thousand dollars. And the last the last bullet point is new walk-in for with, with modern design. So for our for our layout our layout base view, we'd like to have a more Open says uh, students and students and new people could come by and when they look at the Marlin store they could see something. So our main idea is to add like a big Marlin uh, Marlin sticker onto the wall and have like a whole new innovation. And now I'm gonna pass it on to Stefan so we can talk about the price. So hello, everybody's doing good. Um, so for like the renovation itself, it'll range between two to six thousand dollars. That includes the wood tiles, the new paint, uh, the new furniture that we'll put in there, the installations, which we'll be talking about in a sec, and yeah, any like other new like furniture, like new things to put the shirts on or anything, and contractors. That would be a big thing due to I don't know if Wesley and ourself remodels things, but. There's build be list of contractors later on, actually right after this, that we could reach out to and get pricing that way. So installations, we have a Clover POS system because, or it'll be talked about in a little bit, but I heard that the credit card system here does not have all the like banks of America, like it doesn't accept all of them. So we figured a new 
put a POS system would solve that. And then the new add-on electric line, which would be for the POS system. So everything else that's miscellaneous includes like new furniture. Like I was talking to students all throughout the week, and benches are a big thing that we would like to see in there. It helps with wait time in case the mail room line is long. Um, or just to send them just to talk. And a new sign, a new open and close sign. If people see a new, a new vibrant sign, they're gonna be like, oh, I gotta check it out. It's a new sign. And so from there, I'm going to pass it on. Oh, actually, here's the contract. So W, I reached out to only KBS Incorporated because I was the only ones that answered. Everybody else, I just got sent to a tell or not telemarketer, but another line in which they needed logistics of the school store that I don't have. So they're still up there, and maybe the bookstore has the logistics to give to them so they can receive the, their renovations. But every, or KBS said that they wanted us to be a company, so I wasn't able to reach out, like get the pricing for them either. And so now I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Isaiah, to talk about the Clover POS system. Investing in a Clover POS system allows any business to improve their stable game decisions. The POS system helps to reduce the cost of goods so that we can focus on the improvements to help the customers. With the quick investment of $2,000, this fragment of the university storage can invest into a POS system to improve and change a high-tech and innovative shop. Now I'm going to pass it over to Kaya to talk about the social media. So technology is used in everything we do, from the smallest everyday tasks to school to the workplace. A technological advancement is always present, and we as businessmen and women should be using this to advance our brand and ourselves forward. And the best way to do this is through social media. With the high social media platform, you are 45% more likely to have more sales opportunities, and in turn, businesses are over 50% more likely to reach their quotas. And if we look at this outside of just a smaller community, more so worldwide, 90% of the top business owners today are using some form of social media to engage with their customers and also to promote their brand. And just because the Marlin store is relatively a smaller business, this does not mean we cannot use the same strategies to advance ourselves into the future. So we as a team have decided that Instagram would be the best platform for the Marlin store. This is just like any other social media platform. You create a profile, come up with your username, a profile picture and you're allowed to post pictures and videos that pertain to your business. And one advantage is that in the bio on Instagram, the Marlin store can be linked so that your viewers can directly access the homepage of the store rather than going through the Virginia Wesleyan website to find it. Um, Instagram also has a story for every account and with that there are a lot of advantages. So for example, they have a questions feature. So when this is used, your viewers have the opportunity to ask questions, get feedback, or just anything they have to say. And it's more so like leaving a review on a web page. However, it's more direct and you'll instantly get the notification. So with this, you're more likely to have quicker responses and this increases your customer satisfaction. Um, moving forward, we currently know that there is a designated person that comes up with merchandise design. However, we want to include the student body to feel more engaged in the store. So with this being said, we believe that coming up with different designs, potential designs, and allowing your viewers to vote on which design they would like to see in the store in future purchase will help everyone feel like they are included in something and want to purchase from you in future references. Um, there's also a countdown feature. So currently, a lot of emails are sent out pertaining to promotions and different events in the store. However, the majority of your customers are young adult college students. And with that being said, not everyone is willing to read an, an email into its entirety. However, they are willing to look on Instagram. So this way, Instagram will count down from the hour to the minute to the second, and they're more likely to see when these promotions are going on. Um, we also believe it would be important to engage in some type of student faculty takeover. So you can get the athletes involved, or just when a student purchases an item, give them opportunity to, hey, would you like to take a picture or post a short video on our Instagram for publicity, and when other students see them doing that, they will also want to become a part of that. And social media is the best way to do this in order to make your customers feel as though not only they are a customer, but as if they are engaged and in the model store without physically being there. And now I'll give it over to our team. Hi, so for, uh, we are providing a technological solution. And then in my section, I'm going to focus on how to find out about the identity steps that still have to be more effective. And then I'll 
Just for a quick overview of everything you heard today, we heard from Josue and Stefan about potentially remodeling the bookstore and the price that has the most variation would be anywhere from 7000 for just the base items and some physical changes to an actual remodel to somewhere up, up to $12,000. We heard from Isaiah about the addition of a Clover POS system and the ability to streamline the cash out and the checkouts of the store. And we heard from Kaya about the social media and how it would greatly improve the foot traffic and the eyes that the university store gets. And we heard from Atsuko about sales promotions and how advertising and the improvement of that can also um, boost your sales and the foot traffic that the store sees. Um, that's all from us today. We hope to hear from you. Give us an email or give us a call with our business card.
Hi, we are Kim Jet. Uh, we're here to provide first class consulting service. Um, my name is Carlton. This is Marcel. This is Emily, Jason, Ethan, and Tommy. The target is um, the University Model Store. This is this photo here. Um, Through our process, we came up with our name um, via like all of our first names by taking a letter and making the word Kim Jet. We thought it was an interesting idea and um, we rolled with it. We took the five, we started brainstorming um, through our first meeting together um, and came up with the five top ideas that we expanded on um, so that we could um, show you today. Um, we decided to divide up the work um, together and um, each, each take a point where we take an idea uh, of the store. Uh, each board members took, uh, took this and worked very hard, um, including all our ideas and improved on them very well. Our goal is to upgrade expand and inc increase, um, ex upgrade, expansion, and improve connection. Uh, with this being with just new technology and innovation, more stock and traction in the store, and just connection with student and alums. We want you to increase, we want to increase traction with the store so that you are proud of your store. For our SWOT analysis, through our strengths, we, uh, we pride ourselves on being different and bringing like, bright new ideas um, to the table. Um, for our weaknesses, we have no real ex experience um, with consulting, but we, uh, we make up for it for our lack of knowledge by working really hard and hopefully gaining experience. Um, our opportunity, we've been gifted a golden opportunity to um, consult, like start a consulting business um, with um, the university store. Um, our threats are just we are aware that there are other consulting uh, firms out there, um, but we want you to believe that we are the best uh, for you. I will not pass it on to Marcel for advertising. Advertising is the main way to display to the customer what you have to offer and why they should spend their money on you. Um, looking deeper into how you guys advertise, I wanted to focus more on the social media aspect. More specifically, Instagram, which is a platform of over 2 billion users. As you can see on the screen, um, this Instagram profile I found has a, a pretty decent audience of 223 followers. But what stood out to me the most was that the last post that was made was almost four years ago, back in 2019, meaning that the profile is obsolete and out of date. Thanks. Social media is huge in this time and age due to it being practically ubiquitous and is the fastest way to reach your customers via cell phone or computer. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you guys out there manage a social media account, uh, whether it's Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok? Stick a look around. It's a, it's a lot of you guys. Um, with that being said, 76% of our target, target audience has a social media account, meaning that um, a new post about an upcoming item can spread across campus or this classroom in a matter of hours. Oh, thanks. With the majority of the staff being um, students and managing accounts since they were um, younger adults, uh, upkeep should be pretty easy as um, the youth are really good with technology and managing accounts. Um, it's completely free, which is huge when running a business because less money is better. And um, you have 24-hour uh, access uh, to this, meaning that you'll be able to like, comment, share, whenever and wherever you please. Next. Um, here I have listed, here I've listed some ideas to keep our, our followers and potential, potential customers engaged. Um, the first one being weekly giveaways for the followers, meaning that um, once a week you give away an item, uh, which would be um, nice. Um, consistent posting to stay relevant on feeds and stay up to date and interacting and collabing with other VWU pages to build our audience and expand. 
And now to Emily to talk about our advancements. So here is a sneak peek of some of our software updates and I'm gonna get us started with our reward system. So we wanted to create a way for students to buy, earn, and redeem their points. As a college student, I'm not looking to spend a bunch of money. What student is not gonna get involved in their campus to earn rewards? I know I would. So what a reward system is, it is a system where students can use their points to gain discounts in the store. The more you save, the larger discount you will have. The points are going to be stored on your student ID just like your Marlin Bucks and Flex Dollars. You can view your points in a link provided by us in WebAdvisor. So how to earn points. You can earn your points by purchasing items in the school store, getting good grades, participating in on-campus activities, and completing our surveys. By gain accessing your points, they will be a drop box. If you participate in a school activity, we will have a drop box in WebAdvisor where you can choose which activity you would prefer and it would add your points into your card. After each survey, after the submission, points will be added to your account and you'll gain them like that. Or if you purchase items in the school store, we will have a little swiper. You can swipe your student ID and that's how you'll access your points. And finally, so applying your points, you can use these points at any time. Obviously, like I said before, the more points you have, the larger the, the discount you can have. Our discounts will be up to 60%. By swiping your card at the checkout, the points will be added to your purchase. We do not only want to use these points to have students come into our store, but we want to get students more involved on campus with our activities and using these points as leverage. I will now pass it to Jason to talk to you about these surveys. So I'm going to go ahead and add on to what Emily was talking about with the, um, with the surveys. So they may sound like a small improvement, but they are actually the most accurate in terms of trying to get people's opinions. Um, go ahead. Um, so using these surveys, we'll be able to uh, figure out what our students want and what they want to see in our school store. And um, we will also be implementing a QR code so the students can easily and quickly access these surveys. Um, so our overall goal for these surveys is to obviously generate more revenue and see what our students actually want to see in the school store and what they want to buy. Um, we want to obviously have everybody come to an agreement and um, uh, have everybody kind of see what they want to want to buy and what they want to um, see the most in the school store. Um, we want to gen generate the most revenue and. Um, expand on getting feedback so we can build more onto the school store. Here's some examples of what some survey questions may look like. Um, what do you like most about our school store? What would you like to see more sold in the school store? And how often do you visit the school store? These survey questions can be expanded into more of the, of the um, school overall. So we can go ahead and ask questions about the cafeteria food, maybe uh, different activities in the gym, etc. Now I'll be passing it on to Ethan talking about heat mapping. Thank you. Hey, my name's Ethan and I'm going to be talking about the retail heat mapping we are going to have in the school store. How it works. We would need to install um, two to three CCTV cameras. These cameras cost anywhere between 100 and $150. And what these cameras do is they uh, record everything and they uh, track the movements of everybody and it tells how long people will stand in a spot, how many times people walk by a certain spot and stuff like that. And uh, by using this in the store, we would be able to tell where people walk by the most, where people stop the most, where people pick up stuff the most. So that way we can uh, arrange the store in a way that sells the most items. As you can see in the uh, top right corner, that is an example of a retail heat map and the areas in red are areas that people walk the most, stop the most, and stuff like that. The areas in green are areas where um, people walk the least and stop the least. And we can use that to uh, arrange the store and use the, um, put the items that we want to sell the most in the areas in red. And maybe uh, put, if we want to boost the areas in green, we could put uh, items that are new or put like promotions over there so people will walk down there more. Uh, more on retail heat mapping. Uh, 
a cool thing that retail heat mapping does is it tracks uh, how long people stay at a certain spot. So it can tell uh, if people just pass by an item, if people just look at an item, if people um, like stay at an item, pick it up, and then go to buy it after also as well. So we can use that to further the store and arrange it in a way to make sure that people are picking up uh, items and buying them. How this will benefit the store is uh, by placing the items in where people walk the most and by changing the store around in a way that is friendly to people to walk around. Uh, it will increase sales. And we found that in other retail stores, uh, sales increased four to nine percent. And that is a huge thing that we want to improve in the store is the sales. Um, so we really think that this is a great idea to help make the store a more pleasing environment. And now I'm going to pass it on to Tommy to talk about our art competition. Hi. So our com we are going to hold an art competition here at Virginia Wesleyan. And this art competition is going to um, allow students to make a new design for a sweatshirt in the school store. Our art competition is going to be hosted in the month of October and will last the entire month. We're going to put the uh, submission box inside the school store and um, it will be picked up on the last day that, um, of October that um, the school store is open. So uh, we have gotten some judges for our uh, competition here, right from Virginia Wesleyan. So we have uh, Nancy Chapman, Executive Director of Marketing and Communications, and we have Kelly Cordova, Chief of Staff. And uh, we selected these um, uh, women because I reached out to uh, President Miller, and he uh, suggested these two ladies to, uh, um, to judge our competition. And I um, respect his opinion, and I um, hope they do a very good job. Uh, they will be judging on creativity and what they think would be the best um, logo for a sweatshirt in the school store. So um, we are a business, so we have to make money off of this. Uh, the sweatshirts are going to cost uh, $25 for um, $25 for a preliminary purchase, and the um, we're going to buy 20 of them, so um, come out to about $500. And um, the uh, in the store the um, sweatshirts will be sold for around $40, so it'll be around a $15 profit margin, which is a very good margin. Um, the benefits of this is that we're going to be able to get fresh new ideas into the school store, and um, people are going to be able to express, um, express their art on the new logos, and this will be a conduit for a lot of the art students to get involved with the school and give them um, something <clears throat> to show um, show with the school. And um, again, this is going to enable fresh, young, fresh new ideas for the younger generation, and it should bring a lot of traction to the store because um, it's something new. And um, for those of you who do not know the hours um, or information about the school store, here is the, uh, some of the information. And uh, while it's up there, I'm going to go over uh, what we talked about today. So we talked about advertising, and we talked about software um, advancements, and we talked about um, our hardware advancements. So um, we tried, we know you're a business, so you have to make money. And um, we tried to make our advancements as cheap as possible, um, but also very effective. As you can see um, from our presentation, two of our, um, two of our items costed real money. The other three we're just not very much money. So we want to make sure that we spend less money and make more money. If you would like to reach out to us after uh, this presentation, here's our social medias and, and, um, and um, email. And uh, we would love to answer questions for you. And um, again, we are ChemJet, and we provide first class service.
so my question is, it's a lot to handle, and there's three of us who operate, and you know, it's, it's a lot of trial and error. So, well, are you recommend? Are you uh, so are you presenting that this list is handled? It's like that people actually handle the list itself are automated systems, because you're suggesting software that's linked to our cards, um, the web, web advisor system. Like, is there a cost associated with that, or like how would it work with IT and things like that? Because it sounds nice, it does. But that's a lot of work that gets added to the bookstore staff, and I don't know if that part of that should be done. Um, yes, the, um, the surveys will be automated. Um, they had uh, the open answer questions for the pictures, but um, mostly we're going to do it um, of uh, multiple choice questions. And then with your other question was the, um, what was the other part of the question? It was how would it be implemented? Because would it be like manual, somebody has to do this themselves, or would it be automated? It's a lot of work, what you're, what you're presenting. Yeah, it'll be automated, and the only um, manual work would be um, the people looking at the results for the surveys and then um, we're gonna put like a bulletin board up and then we'll have the QR codes on the bulletin board and it's also available for students can put up their their surveys that they will have um, I know I got an email from one of my friends that uh, they wanted me to answer a survey for them for their final projects and that'll be a good way for the students to be able to get their um, projects up on, out for everyone to see Um, it would be implemented in the school store, and it's not just for the art students, it's just the artistic people would probably have uh, more of the advantage for the art competition, but um, it's open for everyone in, the, everyone in the store, whoever can come up with the best idea. You talk a lot about improving the actual sales for students. Are students currently the major buyers of products in the school store, or is it another demographic? We aren't allowed to get the financials for the school store, so we wouldn't know that information. The school covers um, all outside check, yeah, all check. Any more questions? We did not speak with IT at all. Thank you.
Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for taking the time to listen to our presentation. We are Marlins Plus Consulting, and we'd like to dedicate this presentation to enhancing Marlin experience. So before we jump in, we'd like to first give everyone a brief overview of our presentation. You can see in the outline here on the slide that we'd like to start with introducing ourselves as consultants, who we are and what we stand for, and then a little SWOT analysis since this is a business course. Um, next, we are going to briefly run over some client analysis, mostly the competitive advantages we see Scrivener that Scrivener offers. Third, we will dive into our strategic approach. This will be the meat of our meal and our value proposition to Scrivener. Um, this, this concept is going to be product themes. With that being said, please keep that concept in mind. We're going to expand later in the presentation on that. This will be followed by our fourth concept, or sorry, our fourth line, um, our marketing approach, then our financial analysis, and finally our conclusion. All right, to start, let's meet the team. Who are we? We are a team of student athletes dedicated to increasing the influence and convenience of the Scribner Bookstore for the VWU community on and off the sports field. With that being said, here's our, here's our team. I am the CEO. My name is Alexandra Brewster. I am CEO Floyd Wells. I am CTO Garrett Kellum. I'm CFO Jackson Dinger. I'm CMO Jackson Rockhill. And I'm head of HR Zachary Tucker. And our resumes are also attached in the proposal if you need more information. Continuing, we'd like to jump into. Okay. Now that you all have met the team, we'd like to jump into our. Um, our key, three key themes that we have, we'd like to bring to the table, table in improving convenience and influence for the store. Inclusion, because we understand that every semester VWU grows more diverse and there's more preferences, all of which we will take into consideration when sourcing influence. Next is community. The VWU community will not only be our primary source of revenue, but our target market which is of extreme importance when developing an, ap an approach. And lastly, convenience, because we want to offer more easily access, accessible products to campus students and stakeholders without taking away from their valuable priorities. With that being said, I'm going to turn it over to our capable head of HR, Zach Tucker, to give you our SWOT analysis. Uh, this is our SWOT analysis for Marlins Plus. Our strengths are that we are very creative, we're youthful, and we have uh, very good strengths in digital design. Um, our knowledge of what students want is uh, very strong as well. And our ability to communicate with our generation, with younger students. Our, weak our only weakness is we do not work for the Scrivener Store yet. Um, Uh, we have plenty of opportunities. Uh, we have new advertisement opportunities. Uh, we have opportunities to reach new markets. Uh, we have brand new designs that haven't been seen in the store yet. Um, we have uh, strong innovative strategies. And our threats are that we have a lack of community interaction and other retailers. And if the Scribner store chooses another consultant team. And now let's look at our client analysis. Um, the advantages we saw for the Scribner store is that the store is local. In fact, it's in the heart of campus. And the Scribner store is also the sole supplier of the VWU merchandise. And now back to our CEO, Alexa, for our strategic approach. Thank you, Zach. All right, now for our strategic approach. Our value proposition, aligning it with our mission statement, is the main course of our presentation. And that is product themes. 
Our proposition is to increase, conveni to increase convenience and influence, is to maintain many inventory-like subsidiaries. Scribner currently has a lot of these already, and they're extremely popular. Just about all of us in here can vouch that we've purchased some type of item or product from the store at some point being on this campus, and we've either worn it recently or it's in our room right now. This is, this is definitely the case with sports clothes, with gift accessories. So we're proposing five main product themes, all of which fall under the categories of fashion, fitness, housing, and utility. And we have the names of those subsidiaries up here, but we're going to go more into depth in those in the next slides. We have a little spreadsheet here listed with some um, items that would be in there. Now I'm going to turn it over to our very capable CTO, Garrett Kellum, for our analysis on this. So our first subsidiary group is Marlin Stark. Marlin Stark takes the normal Virginia Wesleyan clothing, white and Virginia Wesleyan blue colors, and turns them into black clothing. We have a couple examples up here of our styles and our clothing and our fab fabric. Um, as you can see, the cost per shirt is going to be about $20, 20 to $25 per shirt, and we're going to be selling it at about $30 to $40 per shirt. Next, we have Marlins Retro. Marlins Retro brings back old styles and makes them new again. This is designed to bring back the alumni and to capitalize on the trends of bringing old stuff and making them new again. We also have a couple designs up here to show you. Um, based on the design and the fabric, we could see a variance cost of somewhere similar to $20 to $25 per shirt and about a price point of $30 to $40 per shirt selling it. Next, we have Marlins Fit. Um, Marlins Fit is for the student athlete and gym rat and every student. Now, we offer uh, various products such as gym accessories, um, gym clothes, anything that you'll need for working out around campus. We have a couple examples of our product line here. We have a custom Virginia Wesleyan protein shaker, a custom Virginia Wesleyan compression sleeve, and a custom Virginia Wesleyan gym socks. Next up, we have Marlin's Dorm. Marlin's Dorm is for the dorm decorations, housing ones, housing needs, and general, ed, uh, and general entertainment. We have a couple, uh, we have an example of our tapestry that we think students would like here. Um, we have, uh, we offer LED lights, uh, Xbox controllers, PlayStation controllers, laundry detergent, and a custom Virginia Wesleyan JBL speaker. Finally, we have Marlin's Utility. Marlin's Utility is for anything, any needs of completing projects around campus and for any projects in class. We have a couple examples of what we would provide here, such as toolkits, flashlights, and HDMI cables. Next, I will be turning it over to our COO, Floyd Wells. We asked 48 of your customers to fill out our polls for these five categories just show. For our Marlins Utility. For our Marlins Utility, the speakers and portable toolkits led this poll. Next, for our Marlins Retro and Dark. For our Dark theme, 28, or 24 of our students selected this. And then for the vintage apparel, 22 students selected it. For Marlin's Fit, the protein shaker was very popular as it doubled every other poll. And then Marlin's Dorm, we had four items selected. Um, the LED lights, the tapestries, HDMI cables, and the laundry detergent. Now I'm going to hand it over to our CMO, Jackson Rockhill. 
now that we've gone through our strategic approach, I'd like to take you through our marketing approach. Our marketing approach is going to be solely social media based as we feel it's going to be the best way to reach students ages 18 to 22. Um, Meta is the most influential um, social media platform consisting of Instagram and Facebook uh, with 3.6 billion monthly users. This is an example of what our Instagram page will look like. Um, as you can see, we have posts through our different product lines, and we'll be able to communicate with students firsthand through direct messaging. I'll turn it over to Jackson Dinger for our financial analysis. Hello, I'm here to talk to you and run us through our Marlins Plus financials. First, we will be taking a look at our first subsidiary's break-even analysis. We have Marlins Fit. In the bottom left-hand corner, you can see that we will be required to sell 20 units in order to generate a revenue of $366.67. This would allow us to break even. This can be seen on the graphs where the gray and the blue line intersect. There's also a orange line on the graph. This represents our fixed cost, which is $100. We will be uh, implementing this $100 into and reinvesting it into the subsidiaries at the beginning of each month. Um, similar to the last graph we saw, Marlin Stark will again need to sell 20 unit, units in order to break even. However, the revenue in or, will be higher in order for us to make our money back. Next, we'll take a look at Marlin's dorm. Marlin's dorm is going to require us to sell 27.27 units, and this would have us breaking into the profit margin at $390.91. As we continue to look at our financials, we'll look at Marlin's Retro's break-even analysis. Here, we'll only need to sell the sale of 15 items in order to create a revenue of $575. And finally, we have Marlins Utility ending us off with a required units of 16.67 units. Um, at 16.67 units, the bookstore will have made a revenue of $522.22. Next, we look at the comparison of all of our break-even analyses for each subsidiary. Um, here we can see that Marlins Retro had the lowest unit cost with only 15 units required to sell and Marlins Fit required the lowest generated revenue at only $366.67. Um, after calculating our averages we found the break-even analysis for Marlins Plus as a company um, and we found that we will have an average unit of 19.788 and we will require an average revenue of $490.96. In conclusion, Marlins Plus In conclusion, Marlins Plus could break even just with the individuals who responded positively on our polls. Marlins Plus received an average of 23 or more individuals who wanted at least one item on the one of the five product lines. This exceeds our break-even point of 19.78 units, meaning that we already have a area where we could break into a profit margin. Thank you for listening to our presentation and I invite you to ask any questions.
um, brought in slowly. We don't expect, uh, we are not requiring every item to go in there at the same time. Um, currently, our most, uh, most popular lines, the VW Black Apparel, the VW Vintage Apparel, would most likely go in there first, if possible. And then the smaller items, such as the protein shakers, the JBL speakers, uh, some of the tapestries can be rolled up and stored pretty efficiently. So we are expecting those uh, higher volume products to go first. Additionally, when other items come into the store, there's room that's made or rearranged the way that the items can be placed properly. There's also like some similar items that are in there and I spaces will just be moved around to accommodate for that. You talk about all the revenue you're getting from specific products. What's the profit uh, for the amount of products you sell? How many, what's the profit from the units that you said you needed? What's the profit that would result from selling that much? The profit would be projected over a long ra longer range period of time. We okay. just presented how long and what it would take for us to break even at that point in time and how many units would be present. Yes, so we showed that the break even analysis, we showed where it would, we where we would start making profits. So after $490, we would start making profits. Any other questions? Um, the store doesn't sell, uh, what would be the for? I used to sell food, drink, and milk, and so things move now over to the market. Okay. So that's when you can get your detergent or put a request in Just say you compliment when the slides weren't working right, when they went in the right order. Uh, I didn't see panic in anybody's eyes. So congratulations. It's happened to every salesman in the world. So nice work. Thank you. Good job. John, thank you. Uh, because we understand that it's the creator of tomorrow, we, 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 we decided against uh, printing out our posts. We noticed that you already had them online. However, everyone needs to eat, so we have a bunch of crumble cookies for you. And if you contact your kids, I just started contacting about anything in particular. My personal assistant. Yeah, Phil, who's next? What man? Who's working next? I'm waiting for everyone to be quiet. <laughs> Hello everyone, and welcome to Marlin Marketing Solutions. We are a consultancy agency working on making the school Scribner store better in terms of profits, which is why we exist for you. Throughout our presentation, we'll be going through what we believe should be the primary goal, which will drive profits. We'll look at data from what we've been given and we'll then provide solutions which will minimize the costs in them, but maximize your profits through optimizations and not costs which have a chance at making money. Our solutions will make you money. And now we go on to Jessica to talk about who we are. This is our team. We are a representative of Collaborate with Seven to not only um, uh, to not only increase your profits, but also to your marketing. Um, and now we will move on to our business description with Rose. Our group is made up of a 40-60% share with our leader, Jonathan, having a 40% share of the stake. And the six of us agreeing to, have, to each have a 10% share of the stake. 
we are made up of, we our business is made up of three departments our visual design department our marketing analysis department and our business of operations department my partner jessica and i work together on the visual design team isaiah and devon work together on the business of operations on the marketing analysis team and Josue and Huber jointly work on the on the business of operations team. Now I'm going to turn it over to our CEO Jonathan, who will talk about to talk talk to you about our focus on marketing. All right. Well, why do we want to focus on marketing here? Well, that's simple. If we look here, marketing is equal to success. If no one knows about your business or knows what you have to offer, then no one's going to come to your business. No one's going to buy stuff from your business. And as a result, the better marketing a brand has, such as Walmart, Target, or even luxury brands such as Tesla, the more that people know about them and the more people buy into their goals is the reason why they have so much sales and so much success. By increasing your marketing, we can see direct profits result from that through brand recognition. We can see that through positive brand perception. And as a result, if you have people loving your store and loving what the store does, you'll see people wanting to come to the store over other competitors. If they want to buy a hat or they need something that they need to buy, like a shirt or school supplies, because they believe in your store, they'll come to you first. Now, how do we do that? It is through our initiative and our mantra called Through the Door. That is because what we consider customer conversion rates, which are the likelihood of someone entering the store or a web space actually purchasing something, when they enter the store, it is 10 times greater. I believe the data shows about 20 to 30%. We have data shown in our proposal for that specifically. However, when we see this, that people, once they enter the store, they're instantly more likely to buy things. As long as we put people into the store, because they want to be in the store, we will see a result in increased profits immediately. So as a result, we believe that the top thing that we have to do is increasing the amount of people in the store, which is what we want to focus on today. So how do we do that? This is much more laid out in our proposal, but I'm simplifying it for today to make sure it doesn't make anyone's brains explode. <laughs> so. What effectively we do is we survey our customers. We survey our potential customers. We survey people who might not think of being customers, but will be. This includes students. This includes faculty. This includes the family, friends, and relatives of the students in this university. Because fundamentally, the people who are buying stuff from the store have to be in the store. So if we make sure that we market to them and not to people who cannot enter the store, we can see an increased amount of people through the door. And that will result in increased profits. And once we understand what marketing works for them, we can see which specific methods we can use to appeal to them through advertising, through email blasts, which are fundamentally, in our eyes, the best way to connect with our customers. Because that's what, because if we use a social media presence, we believe that won't work. Because if we use social media, we'll be appealing to people who can't enter the store. And that is a fundamental issue with that. However, emails will automatically connect to everyone in the university. And as a result, they are the best way to ensure that everyone will hearing your message, your deals, your promotions. And that's what I believe we have to focus on. Now, when we talk about our market, we're going to be going to Isaiah to talk about what we see the store currently as. So yeah, what does our agency see the store as? Well, our agency sees the store as a gift shop rather than the store that students and residents of VWU can use every day. And this is mainly due to the items that are in the store. The items that are in the store suit the students and residents' wants rather than their needs. This leads to more of guest-driven guest -driven revenue. Ultimately, we're trying to change that narrative for our through-the-door methods. The through-the-door methods would be benefited through the high traffic Baton area that the store is located in, and if we change it to students, we'll get more income and people walking through the store. And um, our quick disclaimer about our data is that we couldn't get raw uh, raw um, 
rock hard evidence of data collection because of certain blocks. So it is rough estimates. And now I'll pass it to Devon to speak on our data. Uh, how y'all doing? As you can see in graph one, you see this is the graph we how we did the data was monthly wise from the first of the semester to the end of what well, this semester per se. So as you can see during August twenty of August of twenty twenty two, the most most crowd of income was textbooks during that time, and the second off was clothing. And you see the rest, and also you see the rest of them was lower than a decrease. But as you can see in, in graph two, we took off August's, oh no, August's month, monthly revenue. And as you can see now, clothing was the top number one sales, salesman, per se, during that time. So now I will pass it down to Alex to don't, come on. We're recommending change in the store because we believe that there are several fundamental issues that are affecting the long-term growth of the store, beginning with students not necessarily being the primary consumers. We believe that the store appeals more towards the guests that are arriving on campus for visits and such, and as well as parents of those students. Um, and we believe this leads to a low interest from the students in the store because we believe that if they're not you know, wanting to go into the store to buy clothing, then they have no reason to go into the store to begin with. And general goods are typically pricey. Um, when students see the prices compared to Walmart and Target and general retailers of that such, um, they see that they're going to go ahead and buy their supplies and their needs for school at those retailers instead of the bookstore. And that leads to students just avoiding the store to begin with as a whole. Again, non-competitive prices compared to the general retailers. And again, if they don't want to go in the store to buy apparel or clothing for their parents or for themselves, then again, they have no reason to go into the store to begin with. And we believe that the store has a poor selection of choices. Um, typically, the store is made up of simply just clothing and apparel as opposed to student needs such as pens, pencils, textbooks, book bags, and all that such. And to basically bring out the long-term growth from a positive standpoint, we believe that we need to appeal to students' needs as opposed to their wants, such as clothing and such like that. Um, and we need to grow available opportunities in the store, which I will now pass it to Hubert so he can tell you guys about our ideas to help with that. Hello. So we have detailed our solution in our proposal to be, uh, but here is a brief rundown of our suggestion. We believe that improving the selection and prices are essential to retaining uh, the student's population. Having a premier brand product with a modest markup will give the store a sense of a value and bring a positive perception of the store. We believe that we're reaching Original product, products like supplies to be more accessible for students makes the store more convenient for students, which gives them a reason to rely on the store for their needs. Store events should be a rebrand of the store instead of just adding the, the seasonal products. We encourage the inclusion of the of decorations throughout the throughout those events. For example, adding uh, stickers or heart balloons during the Valentine's days. Lastly, we suggest the implementation of game day candygrams for all school events. We support events bringing spectators to our campus. We would like to extend the opportunity for them to, to, to for them to come in here. Oh my, sorry, for those who are here to be there for our students, game day candygrams bring people through the day through the door of our store as well, making it the perfect addition to our events. We know that our student that we presented will increase the customer traffic, which translates the greater sales. I will need to jump. Uh, right? Now, before I finish off and ask for questions, I'd like to go over some solutions that we ultimately did not wish to go with. For example, when we looked at adding new clothing sales to the store, 
and we actually considered adding, trying to connect Marlin Flex dollars to the score, store sales. The former of which we deemed was rather impossible due to the contract situation with Studexco and with that contract uh, contesting with our ideals, we decided to drop that idea in totality because that would make a larger mess than it would ultimately prove to be convenience for. When it comes to clothing, we decided that the current apparel in the status quo is fine and spending more money on different kinds of clothing would ultimately prove not to change sales at all. We, we have already ex created expenditures in the purchasing of these clothing and we should see them be sold before we look at adding new selections to our portfolio in products. When it comes to a reward system, we believe that the actual price of discounts would harm the store more than it's worth because the reason why students aren't entering the store right now is because they don't see value from it. And yes, while we see reward systems can bring value to it, we first need to make sure that they trust the store to begin with and come to the store regularly for their needs. Once we see that, then we can consider putting in a reward system. But in the status quo, that does not sound logistically feasible. When it comes to remodeling the store, we decide against that because fundamentally, even though it will drive a short bump in revenue at the beginning, we believe that the cost of renovating ultimately would not offset the cost of the renovations at all. Even though, because we can't just do things just to make a little bit more revenue, we need to do things to make sure that they generate a lot of profit. And for that reason, we decided against doing a renovation of the school store. Now, are there any questions? That is a valid reason to bring up. However, we have to also keep in account how much that will cost the store. We currently sell shirts for how much? From 25 to 40 bucks, right? So by doing those kind of deals, the store would lose that much money and they wouldn't make a return on that as well. So if we want to offer rewards that would actually drive up actual sales, we would need to put products in that we make a high margin on so that the discount would just reduce our margin and not create sales at a loss. Stefan. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, Joe. Yep. Yeah, I can see what you mean by actually using social media to grow the student uh, proportion of sales. However, because of how the store is currently constructed in products, it's currently catered towards guests. Like, let's say your parents come in to watch you do a, to, to watch a basketball game, right? They'll go into the store and purchase something. Students usually don't go in and purchase something nonstop. The majority of the sales are from these guest-driven revenues. Yes, students are a proportion of that, but they're not a significant proportion of that as of now. Since every student uses their email for their classes, if a school store just did email blast through email, that would reach more students because it'd reach everyone by default, rather than having to grow a social media brand on its own. Wouldn't, how would the parents and alumni get the information about new 
products, new um, promotions, etc. In order to purchase equipment, you typically have to enter the store, correct? Well, there's also an online. Store. Yeah, there is an online component, but majority of sales are in store. And so if they wanted to buy something, they would most likely come onto campus to purchase things, and they'd see the products as they were already. Furthermore, if we can, we can also have emails that are sent out to an alumni already, we can just extend that mechanism to go to alumni, if you want to make sure that all the alumni know about each sale that's going on. Of course. So we already currently get a lot of emails from the school, and I know I'll attest to like, like I ignore a lot of them. How are you going to um, like combat people ignoring email chains or email? Well, yes, of course. If you send out a mass ton of emails, there's going to be diminishing returns on actually providing value and people actually coming in. At a point, if you send out an email like every single hour, people are just going to put it in the spam folder and ignore it completely, right? I'd say when we send out emails, we send only emails with substance, like, like a portfolio of, hey, here's our deals. If you want to come, stop on by. Or, hey, we're holding this event. These are the new things that we have on sale. Come in and check it out. Or if we have a specific event, we can do that that way. Yeah. There's typically like only two to three thousand students. Yeah. So really, I feel like you're only marketing to the students. Yeah. And there's not enough volume of students to, I feel like, drive that like, revenue to the store and get profits. Yeah, that's exactly why the status quo is that it is guest driven because the student population is so small that we have to rely on people coming into the store that aren't students to actually make a profit. However, we see students leaving the school all the time to purchase supplies. If we make those supplies competitive in the store, that will drive products because that is an inelastic demand. Uh, Acacia. Okay. This question is specifically for you um, and your team that has the answer. Cool. So did you conduct any type of research or survey amongst the students before putting this in? Uh, what, in terms of conducting research, we consulted with Kimberly Brown right over here. I mean student research, like, like we, feedback we, from the students before putting this we focus solely on the actual data of what was being sold at the specific times. But how could you do that without getting data from the students Because we see what's being sold. All right, I'm done. Are there any other questions? <laughs> yep. I just finally went over it, but he just said that of course. Yeah. When we, yeah, yeah. When we talked to you, uh, when I was asked questions, you gave me primarily data towards the store itself. So that's what we decided to focus on because that's the only thing we had data for. If we had more information based on online sales, we definitely would have focused on that. However, we can only work with the data we're really given, unfortunately, as we all know. Information is half the battle. GI Joe. Also, though, everything in the online store is exactly when you take it and put it there. So it's of course. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's gr it's great, right? It's great. Yeah. In order to expand that increased sales, we simply just need to, you know, just make it a little bit more optimal for the students because most of these options here are to increase the student proportion of sales, right? And these are solutions that are meant to increase that. While with our game day candy game program, we try to bring more spectators of different events into the store as we uh, lay out in fairly great detail within our proposal. But if we explain it here, it'd take up like 10 minutes, so we don't want to do that. <laughs> well, everybody did a great job. Well done. Oh, one more. Sorry. So, I, I, I you want to touch on the social media again? I understand your point about wanting people to actually come into the store. 
Um, but you mentioned that like parents or alumni who wanted to buy stuff could just come on campus. You wanted to incentivize them to come on campus. I have read like people, this college, especially because of athletic programs and the Baton Honors College program has students from so many different states. Um, students from quite literally Washington State come here to this school based on the programs that we offer. Their parents can't just drive on campus. Of course. So these students' parents should be able to have the same access to these deals in case, say, my mother wanted to buy me something for a birthday present and she wanted to know if there was a deal going on. So you limiting to just email of students and some alumni who would see it, it just, it kind of limits the sales and it doesn't really focus on the online store, which you can really sense this really well. Yeah. I understand. Uh, what I'm specifically focusing on is what's considered the consumer conversion metric, which is the likelihood that if someone enters a web page or a store that they're likely to buy something, currently online is less than 2%. However, if you are visiting a store in person, it's 20 to 40%. So we need to focus on those because what usually tends to happen, according to the actual data on multinational companies, is that if they don't find exactly what they're looking for at the exact right price, they're going to another store, which is effectively window shopping. However, that's less likely on an in-store brick and mortar business. And once you're in a store, I believe there's like a 90% chance that's increased to do an impulse buy on something that you didn't think you wanted, but that you wanted in the heat of the moment. Those kind of sales, when you're there in person, massively drive sales. And I get from like being abroad, I'm from New Jersey, it's like a seven mile drive just to get here from my house. But in, when we talk about actually focusing on what we need to do to increase sales at the store, I prefer to focus in the store because the rest is just improving the selection, which is just by either having better products or better value of products, which is a more of a contract-based order shipment thing, which is not what we're focusing on. We're focusing on the infrastructure of the store. But good question, pal. Yeah. Or my mom buys it online for me. Yeah. And she's more likely to want to do that, or most parents are more likely to do that if they know that there are deals showing on because they'll be, oh, this is the perfect time to get some shirts for my student yeah. for Christmas or for their birthday. That's exactly why in December the clothing sales shot up for those holiday events. Exactly. We want to break the mold on how people saw the store and change the paradigm of how to solve that problem. We didn't want to just add more stuff and hope it worked. We wanted to change the fundamental way that we saw the business and through that different perspective, we could see many ways which we can approach, which is exactly what you did. Of course. Thank you very much. All right, thank you guys. All right, first of all, great job, everybody. Thank you all for asking those great questions to every group, not just this one. Um, we're going to give the judges a little bit of time to go over what they know, so have fun. Thank you all for coming. If I don't get to say that again before the end, and also, our next event is Dress for Success at 11. If you can make it, please do.
word, um, <laughs> you know, other gender identities or other identities. Uh, but I think the biggest thing and the point that we want to make, no matter what we're talking about, is that in whatever clothes you're wearing, you want to make sure that you feel comfortable, that your clothes make you feel confident, and that the clothes represent you and you're representing yourself to that employer in the most positive professional way that you can. So um, that being said, I'm going to kind of see how the best way I can do this. So these are some of the topics that we're going to talk about. And I should have printed out the slides so that would help me. But I'm going to scoot over this way and kind of knock for Wayne away a little bit. <laughs> Can you still, am I still being picked up by the mic? Does that work? Um, so the four dress code styles that we're gonna talk about, business formal, business professional, we're gonna talk about business casual and office casual, and then just casual. And there is a difference, and it's important that as you're going into these different environments that you have an understanding of those different um, outfits and, and what that might mean for you. And so we have pictures that kind of go with that so you can see just generally some of the differences. And so I'm going to start with what is business professional? So what is business professional? Can you take a guess? A suit. A suit. <laughs> It's um, you're like to the nines, fully dressed, professionally. I wish you guys were over here so I could not have to do this. <laughs> um, but when do you use those business professional outfits? When, if you have an interview, if you are going to a career fair, if you're at a professional business meeting, um, you, if you're at a networking event, anything where you're working in business, going to a business function, and trying to make sure that you are representing yourself fully in a full professional um, manner. You also want to think about, you know, traditional industries or the organizations that might require that. So, as business majors, a lot of the like IBM or some of the accounting firms and those things, they're going to expect that they see you in that professional light and that you're wearing those types of clothing. And then suits, pantsuits, neutral colors, black, blue, gray um, are darker colors. You want to stay away from like a lot of the patterns and shirts that match your suit or complement your suit. So you might not, if you're going into a business professional environment and you have on a, um, a black suit or a blue suit, but you might not want to wear a bright yellow tie or a bright yellow shirt, right? Because you'll stand out, but you might not stand out the way that you think you're standing out. And then I think that I switched to you. <laughs> business casual. And before we go into business casual, why do you think we don't want to wear bright or patterns when we're going to interviews and things like that? Why don't we want to do that? We can come across as tacky. Tacky, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Almost come across as unprofessional. Unprofessional. You might not stand out with other people in the room. If you're before you get into the interview, you want to stand out so people choose you. And if you want them back in the house, Yes. And so then, oh, go ahead. Maybe you're like too distracting others. And maybe too distracting others. That's the biggest thing, the distraction piece, right? If you are wearing things that are drawing attention to what you're wearing and not what you're saying and how you're presenting and the answers that you're providing in your interview, that's not the impression you want to make. You want them to stay focused on the value you're bringing, the things you're saying, not necessarily just what you have on. You don't want that to be a distraction. Okay, so going into business casual. Business casual events are going to be those company events, the casual Fridays, um, a term that we recently learned. Um, oh, we'll get that at the next slide. <laughs> um, yeah, and so the company events, social occasions, just opportunities to really 
um, be a little bit more comfortable, um, but you don't want to be inappropriate when it's business casual. More flexible office hours. I'm at Dollar Tree. Um, prior to the pandemic, we were very business professional. We would only have a casual Friday where we could wear jeans or a collared shirt. Now we're pretty much business casual since the pandemic, Monday through Friday, but we still have opportunities. And again, this is why it's important to know what your industry is um, because our merchandising team, for example, they have a little bit more flexibility to be creative because they're merchants. They're buying, they're seeing what the trends are, they're trying to see also what um, will work best for our store. So they have a little bit more flexibility to be creative versus more of our legal team if they're working in our legal department, they're gonna be more business professional all the time. So with business casual, some of those items, um, bottoms can be skirts, flats, khakis, really what's reflected in the picture here. Um, it's just being comfortable, but still professional, because again, you just never know who you'll run into in the workplace. Oh, okay. Casual attire, what is it? Uh, casual dress allows you to be comfortable while still maintaining a somewhat professional appearance. And so one of the phrases that we recently learned about was another term for casual attire is smart casual. And it's just another form for it adding a stylish twist. So I think this is something that your generation has came up with. So that it is, again, you're able to be expressive of who you are, but still fit in with the professional environment, which is a huge plus. So some of these items for casual attire would be, you know, t-shirts, blouses, button-down shirts, sweaters on top, um, the bottoms, jeans, khakis, shoes, can be sneakers, loafers, low heels, sandals, and then casual attire, again, does not mean that you can throw all standards out the window and wear anything you want. One of the things that I learned early in my career is if you could see down it, see through it, or see under it, that means you probably should not be wearing it to work. So that's always an easy, easy reminder of whether or not it's appropriate for the workplace. Can I add something in there? And one of the things I think that's easy for the smart business, the smart ca casual or business casual, well, smart casual that you're talking about, is if you're wearing like a t-shirt and jeans, but if you put a blazer on over it, then it elevates that t-shirt and jeans. So having that in your wardrobe, like a flexible blazer, maybe it's got a little pattern or it's like, a little bit different, not just plain, or even just a plain, navy blue, black, whatever. It, it changes the dynamic of what you're wearing and it elevates those casual clothes. And it notes on the graphic here too, some of those areas that you can see it, entry level employees, so when you're first starting out, again, kind of making that impression um, in the workplace, casual Fridays, what we talked about, industry conferences, um, sales reps, if you're going to um, even a um, company event, maybe that's after hours, that can be appropriate as well. Again, knowing and doing a little bit of research in advance so that you can gauge what um, professional attire you're gonna wear to that event. So this slide is kind of testing your knowledge a little bit. We're gonna continue to have some little test your knowledges as we go through this because it's not just about us talking at you, but you like kind of starting to think. And I think that one of the things that's also important, especially for students that are in that, you know, like you're beginning that transition phase, you have what you have in your closet. So we're not saying you need to necessarily go out and purchase a whole new wardrobe so that you can be ready for the workplace. It's always good to shop and I'm, I'm you know, good, like to shop too, but how can you take what you have and make it work for you? So it might be just buying a blazer or buying a couple of different shirts so that you're not breaking the bank. And so you wanna think about all the different circumstances and situations where you might have to dress in a particular way. So this um, scenario is, you know, like if you were invited to a company event outside of work, maybe it's like a Saturday family picnic um, and you have to, you have to attend. So what do you wear? How do you know like what you should put on? Should you wear your suit? Should you wear like casual? Should you go full business casual, smart casual? Like what is it that you're supposed to wear? So first, you always wanna make sure that you ask. So if you have a supervisor or somebody else, ask if there's a dress 
um, guidelines for the event or a dress code so that you can be aware. It's not a bad thing to ask the question. But for this, um, in this situation, we're talking about maybe it's a golfing event or a tennis event or something that's outside of work. What do you wear? So it's not formal and they tell you it's, you know, it's more casual. It's a more casual event. So if it was like a picnic, it's on the weekend, you could wear shorts, um, but you want to try to stay away from wearing jean, like denim shorts. So you just might wear some khaki shorts or some black shorts or some blue shorts or whatever. You also want to pay attention to like how long or short they are. So like kind of thigh, mid thigh length, um, and a polo or a button up, you know, a short sleeve shirt that just is more comfortable, it's more casual, you're gonna be outside, you're gonna be in the weather, so you wanna be able to function. If it was golfing, um, you might pay attention to, does the golf club have a dress requirement? So, or the tennis club, do they have a dress requirement? And so you wanna always ask and make sure that you're following those guidelines. And, paying attention to some of the things. Collared shirts with long sleeves or short sleeves. Um, for the golf club, you wanna make sure that your slacks or shorts are longer. Uh, ladies can wear sleeveless tops, golf tops, golf skirts, golf shorts, but tailored trousers. You wanna cargo shorts, t-shirts, and jeans are generally not what you should wear. So if that's all you have in your wardrobe, if you think that your organization is gonna be asking you to attend these events, that might be something that you wanna think about, like, do I have an alternative outfit? And you don't wear it all the time so that you have it when you need it. Uh -uh. Okay, so uh, this is the business attire guide, and I'll just do this one, and we're gonna swap back and forth so you don't just hear one voice all the time. But these are just examples of business formal, business, business casual, smart casual, and casual. And you can clearly see the difference in how the people are dressed and thinking about like when those outfits might be appropriate. And it's the same for women's attire. You wanna think about you know, how these options can mix and match things um, that it doesn't have to just always be a matchy a matching suit because she might take her black blazer and put it with the gray slacks and there you have like a whole nother outfit it's business professional but it's just not you know a matching suit So what you should not wear, like I mentioned earlier, you can see through it, under it, or um, under, underneath it, look down it, underneath it, and through it, don't do it. Other things that you want to definitely avoid, clothing with logos, um, sayings, things like that, that could be potentially offensive words or graphics, obviously you don't want to wear that to really any corporate or company-wide event unless it's the branded company's you know, shirt. Um, items that are ripped, frayed, stained, or wrinkled, even if it's on trend, it's something that's a little bit too casual for um, any type of corporate event. And anything too tight, too tight, too short, or too revealing. And so that's just a good example. Um, one thing that I always remind students is even for ladies who are, you know, wearing heels, if you wear them out for the night, you probably should not be wearing them to work or for an interview as well if the heel is too high. Um, and again, it just gives you a nice. Uh, representation of what just would not be appropriate going to any type of corporate events. So what would you wear? How would you dress for your first interview with a traditional corporate organization? So if my students could please stand up, if you guys could stand up. This is our participation, okay? So I'm at, ask you guys, I'm gonna go down the line and I want everyone to raise your hand, okay? So the question is, how would you dress for your first interview with a traditional corporate organization? So we have A, show of hands, okay, no. <laughs> B, show of hands, okay, okay.
Okay, we have a couple here. C, for your first corporate interview. And we have C. <laughs> so for the first corporate interview, it would be the last option here. It would be number C, or letter C, excuse me. For the interview, can we, t tell me why C would be most appropriate for the interview. You want to look like you're the best, and looking sharply and the most formal you can be at first impression is important. Mm -hmm, exactly. And B is also appropriate, but in terms of the best option, we would go with C. Okay. So this is a um, similar question, but different options. What would you wear? if you were going to an after hours event with your boss and some colleagues. So we're gonna start here again. Is this an appropriate outfit for an after hours event with your boss and colleagues? <laughs> no? You're not doing too well. Oh, no. <laughs> How about this outfit? Could you wear this to an after hours event with your boss and colleagues? Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, these two outfits in the middle are things that you could wear to an after hours event with your boss and colleagues. But I think the caveat is it depends on what the event is. So, if it was some other kind of professional networking event, these are trick questions, right? <laughs> you, might, you might have to wear a full suit. It depends on what it is. Or you could wear the shirt and the tie and take off the blazer or the jacket and, and be appropriate too. So it depends on what the event is, but these first three could be options, okay? And what would you wear if you were going to a company event <laughs> Golfing, sporting event, or something like that. I would pick Joey's outfit. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 So this is totally appropriate. Polo, shorts, comfortable. It's a sporting event, baseball game, field hockey, whatever, whatever it is. You're gonna be outside in the sun. And um, what about the hat? So a few final thoughts, and I'm going to be rude and turn my back because this is a lot of work. Um, you know, ideally, as you're going out into, oh, first, thank you for our <laughs> and willingness to participate with us. So thank you. You can sit or sit. But so as final thoughts, we want to think about what your appearance says to the employers, to anybody that you're representing, how does that make you stand out? You know, and you always want to stand out in a positive way. You want what you're wearing to reflect you, to reflect the organization. And as I said in the beginning, one of the important things is that your clothing is comfortable. So no matter where you fall, on the spectrum 
of what you represent. You want to think about how that outfit you're wearing is going to reflect you, how it reflects the organization that you're representing also. And, you know, even as a student going to an internship or out in the community for a volunteer event or whatever it is, how does what you wear, what does that reflect back about Virginia Wesleyan, about the business department, about, you know, whatever it is. So always keeping that in the, in the front of your mind. And sometimes people wear things and they think, oh, I look good. I feel good. But other people are going, why are they wearing that? You know, you don't want people to look at you and, and smile and nod and then behind, you know, as you walk away go, oh, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have worn that. Um, we see that a lot in career services. I feel like probably you see that a lot as a college recruiter, that people wear things that they see, you know, maybe on television or promoted by popular culture as business attire or business professional, but what you see on television and what you see in the media isn't always the same way that employers think about what people should wear and should not wear. So you have to kind of um, make those judgments. And yes. Another it, thing I, I wanted to add to is um, one thing we forgot to mention just in the conversation is be mindful of like wearing perfume or cologne or jewelry that makes too much noise or can be too flashy or earrings too big. Those are things you also want to be mindful of because it goes back to what we talked about earlier is it doesn't want to be distracting. People have allergies, so if they can smell you before they see you, that's never a good thing either. So be mindful of that. Yes. So um, the smaller groups that are like not gay big, are those more appropriate? Yeah, those would be more appropriate or even um, post earrings would be good. But hoops are okay just as long as they're like mine are too big. I know mine <laughs> are probably big. too big too. Yeah. <laughs> but they're smaller. Yeah. I was going to talk about this a little bit ignorant, but is there a conventional reason why women aren't expected to wear ties or vice versa why men are expected to wear ties? I think that's just a cultural norm that has been shared <laughs> through society over the years. But uh, I know some, well, I haven't seen that too often, but some women will have a tie with their, you know, suit, with their pants suit. Um, so I think it's just the societal norms of what's acceptable or and whatnot um, going into the career. That's a good question. And so that, with that question, who has not the first question, but the second <laughs> question? Jump the gun a little bit. Or I was slow on the side. I apologize. <laughs> so are the, yes. Um, so like, what other appropriate shoes would you consider to wear with like the current clothing? Like, I know a lot of people like heels, but like, are there any backup options besides heels that you would consider? You can wear flats. Um, I'm a flats girl all day. If you're not comfortable wearing pumps, that's all right. And like what Alex mentioned earlier, you want to show up your most confident. So if you know you can't walk in heels or they're not comfortable or you don't like them, don't wear them to the interview. It's okay if you don't have them on. Or if you want to have a, a, um, a lower heel, a heel that's not as big, that can be a little bit chunkier, that's still comfortable, that's still appropriate if you do want to wear a heel but you're not as comfortable in it. But flats are okay. Mm -hmm. Would you consider like sandals to be okay? Like not like the flops, but like actual. Like, for the interview? Like, oh, well, no, not like the interview, but like the business casual. For a business casual event, a, a sandal would be okay as long as it's not a flip flop. Yeah. Yeah, as long as it's not a flip flop. Um, again, going back to depending on what the actual event is, but under the uh, casual piece, that would be appropriate. Especially if it's in, like an outdoor event. Oh, we'll do cover. Mm -hmm. So, um, in the workplace, no, so at all. You have to know your industry. Um, typically, you stay away from that unless the um, industry or the company, you see it. So if you see it kind of as the norm at the company, um, that would be okay. But going in as like the first time going, not really familiar with it, I would say opt out of that until you get familiar with what the norm is within the corporation. Mm -hmm. um, would like heels and boots be acceptable in any situation? Like a pair of like plain black heel boots, would that also be considered um, as I would 
Yeah. So what what instance would you um, consider wearing like a tan suit? Because I know sometimes that's like kind of popular. What would you recommend for someone who wearing a tan uh, suit? A tan suit? Oh, like tan a tan suit. suit. A tan suit. Yeah. Tan suit. Um, I think if you were like, I wouldn't wear a tan suit for an interview necessarily. Um, if you just are going to work on a regular day, walking in and you, you know, you're dressed in a suit, that's still business professional, but it's, it's an, a tan suit would, could work. You know, like I, I think that again, sometimes the industry is dependent on what you can get away with and not get away with. And I'll, I'll use myself as an example, right? When I was interviewing for positions when I first got out of grad school, my master's is in higher education. So education, teaching, the, the atmosphere and the, the tone is a little bit different than if I was interviewing at a, a, a bank, right, at Truist. So I'm, I have a little bit more flexibility. I had a, it was a blue suit, but it wasn't like navy blue. It was more like a royal blue. Love that suit. Um, <laughs> it was more this color. But I could get away with that in that industry. Although there was a woman that interviewed for a position at a place that I worked and she came in a lavender suit and she had matching purple and lavender, like dark purple, and lavender shoes it matched the suit she was all like color coordinating everything no pantyhose or tights and people that were interviewing her didn't appreciate her outfit um, it was also a career services position and she was going to be working with employers so i think they wanted to see her most professional side like she could have worn that for something else but maybe for an interview she should have amped it up a little bit and came more traditional. So it just depends. Um, for women, does it matter how we style our hair in the different like, stages of like, professional hair? Uh, good question. Do you want to talk about hair? Sure, I love talking about hair. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes back to like what we were saying, like as long as it's not distracting, right? As, at the end of the day, you want to make sure that what you're saying is actually being heard and it's not just distracting. So if you can, I would say for your interview, making sure that it's just off of your face. That's the main thing so that the employer can see your face. Whether you have it down, I know, again, kind of going back to industry, some industries are very conservative. They'll want you to have it like pulled back, like kind of how my hair is right now. But other industries, it's okay if your hair is down, kind of like how you have it right now. Again, as long as it's off of your face, if it's half up, half down, um, kind of like what you have, like I don't know your name, but it's half pulled back and then the other part is down, that would be appropriate as well. Again, because it's pulled back off of your face. And I think the other thing to think about with how you style your hair is if you know you have nervous habits. Um, yeah. There are some people that when they get nervous, they start like, pulling their hair and twisting their hair and wrapping it around their finger and doing a fling in the head over their shoulder, whatever they do, right? Tossing their head till their hair is bouncy, whatever they do. So if you know that's you and you don't want the interview to be distracted by those nervous habits that you have, then that might be something that you would consider and when you're thinking about like, how am I gonna wear my hair for this event, for this, this experience? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I, was, I was curious, uh, do you have any like tips or recommendations for how like men with like not necessarily like, long hair but it's really easy for them to apply for like medium length hair that most employers just will consider long for men to how to make that look more professional um because like my fiance he has like longish hair um and it's too short for him to pull back but he's always like wondered like is there a way to make that look more professional in the business world without having to just chop off, chop off hair? his hair i'm thinking if it's again if it's I guess I have to see the visual of it, but I'm thinking still as long as it's back, as long as it's not like hanging in the face and like taking away from like what he's saying so you can see him, as long as it's pulled back in my mind, that will still be um, acceptable and professional. Yeah. So my question is, I, I like to I like dance suits a lot. Um, like when I wore, I did have done one last week for GMC, but when is it appropriate to wear suits like that outside of the gym? Like different colors, like like the brown <laughs> suit. Oh, that was fine. That 
that was fun. For that event, that was fun. It was professional, it was a suit, you look good. So, I mean, I think that was like a after hours networking event and there's a little bit more flexibility in choosing. So all of my like, because I have like a brown one, I have a tin one, I have like a burgundy one coming in. So those colors I feel like are on like the safe side of the spectrum because they're not too, too bright and I enjoy the most. So should I just save all of those mainly for networking events and like meet them outside of like the office? Um, or I think like if you have that like internship, right? Yeah. So if you already have the internship, you already have the job, you also have more flexibility in what you wear, as long as you're staying within the parameters of whatever the industry's guidelines are for how they expect people to dress. So like, when I came to an interview, I probably wouldn't wear a sweater and black pants, even though it's like coordinated and it's like longer and it could be suitish, it's not a suit, but I can wear this on like an you know, every day. Or if I have a blazer, I think when I did the presentation last semester, I, I wore a blazer and pants. It wasn't like a matching suit, but I could wear that. So like, or if it was brown or burgundy or whatever my favorite color is, I think you have that flexibility to, to wear clothes that represent you and your personality in the job. Right. As long as it's not distracting, it's not offensive, because everybody's not, and I think the times have changed too. You know, like 20 years ago, suits were black and brown, or you know, gray. They were very, like standard. Yeah. When you went to look for something, that's what they told you to look for. But I think we have a little bit more, a little bit more room now because it's, it's today, 2023 is not the same as choose a different shirt or a different color, but the only place where you get to like really reflect your personality a little bit is in your tie. So like we have a couple different ties here today and you can see like a purplish, a reddish with some lines and then we've got like a solid. So I think that you can use the tie, I'm probably not answering the question right, but you can use your tie to help display your personality. So if you want to add a little bit of pop of color, you know, it doesn't have to be necessarily a solid tie. It can have like stripes or maybe it has, you know, it's like a, a I wouldn't say for an interview or anything plaid, but like if you have the job already or you're just going to work, you know, maybe there's a plaid tie. Um, you want to stay away from like the, the cutesy kind of ties, like with Snoopy on it or, <laughs> or Spongebob, although I've, I've seen those ties. Um, the Christmas tie with the cats on it, you know, like maybe if it's a holiday party, you could wear that, 
but like on a regular like basis, that might not be your best choice. So I think it gives you it gives you some room to like display your personality. Also, the pocket squares. Um, people, men wear people wear the pocket squares that like kind of complement their tie, and that's another place where you can add that little pop of color or show a bit of your personality. Does that help? Does that answer? Is that as well as cufflinks do for me? Okay. Mm -hmm. oh. Go ahead. Uh, I understand that in the fashion world, like you have to have specific color combinations for each specific. Does that exist in uh, like business formal wear, or is that just in like a fashion world? So like, if it's fall, you're gonna wear more rusts and browns. Yeah. Then in the spring, you might wear so it's lighter, still brighter colors. I mean, I think that it makes sense. I don't know if it's a rule or not a rule. Gotcha. You know, I think um, probably for some people that's personal preference. Don't worry, I probably phrase it rude too. You answer the question that I want to ask. Okay. <laughs> so let's say you work very casually, like you dress very casually for work, like you're like a paper or something like that, and then you go to a casual or not like a formal event, like a dinner or something. Like your boss invites you and you call you to dinner or something. What could be like the I don't know, the safe bet to wear in that situation. Because like, I guess if you're a lawyer or something and you come from where you can just take off your jacket and you're like, yeah. dressed appropriately, whereas like, would you, I don't know, tailor to the place, how would you approach that? Yeah. I would say it's one of two. Is number one, you want to know where you're going to eat because if it is a higher scale restaurant, then you want to dress to that. If it's just coming out to dinner with your boss and the family, then you would still want to be, I would say, business casual, especially from the example that you gave. But what Alex mentioned earlier is feel free to ask so you know where you're going. And then that way you feel comfortable. Because the last thing you want is to be underdressed somewhere. Yeah. Yes. That's the worst or, feeling. Worse. Way overdressed. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. That was a good question. What are your thoughts on, on bow ties? Are those as acceptable? <coughs> It goes back to what she said about it showing your personality and what your preference is. Um, in my opinion, I like seeing them. Um, again, knowing your industry, if it's more conservative. I think what also is a big part of it is when you're doing something that I guess is traditionally outside of the norm, you have to be comfortable and confident doing it so that it doesn't, you don't look nervous doing it. Otherwise, don't wear it. If you're gonna wear it, be confident you know, in it. Um, bow ties, I think, are appropriate in outside like events, but in terms of the interview, that first impression, I would say a traditional tie would be your best bet. But again, after you get the job, after you have that, you know, um, initial uh, professional relationship established, then feel free to, you know, showcase your, your personality in more of those non-traditional ways. Like bow ties. But that being said, you don't want to do a complete like 360. Yeah. Not even a one one eighty, right? If you if you are not like for example, I, I'll use myself. If I had a job one time where um, there was an unspoken rule that women women at, in the office did not wear pants, like we were not allowed to wear pants. But nobody would like come straight out and say you can't wear pants. It was just like like it was like a secret rule. <laughs> that you had to figure out by being observant. So I was like, I got the job and I started working and then I started noticing like, our boss was a woman and she always wore dresses. She wore suits and she wore dresses. Then there was another lady, she wore dresses and suits or dresses with blazers. No one ever wore pants, even in the winter. It was in New York. And I'm thinking, something's going on here. And so I asked, and they're like, it's not a rule, like nobody really said it, but the lady who was the boss didn't like to see women wearing pants. So it was just like this unspoken rule. So then I started a revolt and we, <laughs> we did wear pants after a while. But she, she you know, she kind of 
said, well, you know, it's not a rule, but, and then she put parameters. You can only wear pants and a blazer if it's a suit that came together, <laughs> not like just whatever. So, so I think like you have to be observant, you have to pay attention, and I think you also need to, to decide like where's your line in the sand, right? Or in the snow or wherever, wherever you are. So you have to figure out what's gonna be comfortable for you. So if you only wear pants, you don't, and you don't wear dresses, you're not comfortable in dresses, then if there's an organization that requires you to only wear dresses, that might not be a place that you necessarily really want to work because they're going to not respect you and your level of comfort with dress, right? Um, the same with hair and everything else. And people ask those questions a lot. And that's something that I always say, like braids, dreads, locks, ponytails, long hair, short hair, whatever it is. If you can't be you where you are, then is that a, the price you're willing to pay? Yeah. You know, you have to decide that. No one can say this is, this is what the answer is to that. It has to be an answer that you think about and reflect on. Like, where are you gonna be at your best? Where can you be who you are? Because you don't wanna be something for the interview and get the job and then like totally change who you are and how you behave because it's not going to work and you won't be at that place very long and you won't be able to keep that charade going like oh this is who i am i'm nice and friendly but really you're not you know <laughs> i dress this way but then you get the job and you like pull off the long sleeves and all your like tattoos and 9,000 piercings and you know all that come out and it's like this really conservative company like how is that going to work it won't so it's also important to do your homework and check out the places talk to people that work there understand what the environment is like so that you know and you can make choices for yourself and LinkedIn is another great resource, especially if you are applying for, you know, jobs and you want to kind of get an idea of uh, the people that work there, what do they dress like, you know, what do they look like, uh, how do they present themselves, what are they talking about, uh, using LinkedIn to look up to see kind of what is the industry norm for that company is another great um, kind of resource and it gives you an idea of you know, this is kind of acceptable, looking at the company's website, what are the images that they're representing, because that will also tell you what the norm or what that um, company's culture is like as well. An another good resource that you can use for that same thing is Glassdoor. Um, it gives a lot of that same information from people that work at the organizations, and you can also sometimes get inside tips about interview questions and things like that. So. Um, use your resources. There are so many available to you. Use your alumni too. Are there any Virginia Wesleyan alumni that work in those organizations? Can you connect with them and get answers about, you know, kind of the real deal, like what's it really like here? So, yeah. Any other questions? Did that work? Was it helpful? Good job. What do I have here? So thank you for your attention. I have my email address up there. If you have other questions or need help, you can also make an appointment using my Calendly link and you can scan the QR code. And then I didn't put um, the contact information on this slide for Verlaine, but it is on the first slide and I'll put it back there. And then this next one is um, a version of the PowerPoint. I think it's similar. Um, so if you want the slides, you can scan and get them. Um, and then I also included a gender neutral guide for professional dress that you know is available there too. So.
Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Han Nees. I will be your moderator today. Um, we are accompanied with uh, three judges over here, uh, eminent uh, people that will go and look at your case. Uh, I'd like to introduce them very shortly. Uh, Sekret Munich uh, from uh, Executive Director of Academic Support over here at Virginia uh, Westland. Uh, Mr. Henry Howell, he's a lawyer at the partner and partner at the Eminent Domain Litigation Group in Tidewater. And actually we also have Greg, Mr. Greg uh, Wansink over here, uh, also from uh, Virginia Wrestling. Uh, before I start out reading the, uh, the, the case, I wanted to make sure that the teams understand their way of, of, of business. When I keep up this thing over here, one minute, you only have one minute to, uh, to go. Speaking 30 seconds, and it's time like that. So now I'll read the first case for you. And in that, uh, I wanted to make sure that the teams A and B already can be seated over here at these tables so the audience see them too. And uh, while they do that, I'll read you the case. Case one. That's that, those two tables, please. Team B, or Team A and Team B. Thank you. You can get some paper, yes. Case one. Uh, Jane Clark, a sales manager at Purdue Pharma, is tasked with expanding the market for their flagship drug, OxyContin. Over the past year, this has become more challenging as opioid addiction rates have been on the rise and more doctors have started questioning the safety of the drug. In a meeting with senior leaders, Clark is given a plan to address the situation. She is to train her sales team on how to downplay the risks of OxyContin and deflect questions about the drug's potential for abuses and addiction. A key talking point in the new training program is, is pseudo-addiction. This term refers to the situation where a patient appears to be addicted, but in fact just is in need of more pain relief. Because pseudo-addiction addiction, indicates that a patient is being undertreated for pain, increasing the dosage of the opioid is recommended. Clark is not shown any medical evidence to back up these claims. Both she and the sales reps assume that the information is accurate. Sales numbers quickly begin to rebound as doctors increase their dosages and Clark's team, sales teams add new clinics to their client list. The bonuses they earn for their efforts are extremely generous helping them to create a good life for themselves and their families. However, as opioid addiction rates skyrocket, Clark begins to worry that Purdue's marketing tactics may be contributing to the opioid epidemic. So, the question that is now posed to both teams is, what should Clark do? You got one minute to confirm along you, and then I will ask Team A to present in five minutes. Thank you.
you want, if you want, you can also do it from your seat. That's okay. I think we all hear you. All right, so uh, Purdue Pharma is the manufacturer of OxyContin, uh, a highly prescript or a highly addictive prescription painkiller. Um, Purdue Pharma has been under scrutiny for potentially fueling the opioid crisis. Uh, Jane Clark was given the task to her sales team to try to downplay the uh, potential abuse and uh, addiction of the opioid crisis. Um, the sales team also received an incentive, uh, incentive for downplaying the potential risks of OxyContin. Um, so, Gene Clark's sales team was, um, they, uh, Purdue Pharma claims they're backed by evidence and how they're not addictive, but, I mean, they aren't given actual facts in the case, and they are honestly incentivized to convince in this messaging as they receive bonuses as a result for their sales. And when they're talking to the doctors and physicians, they are being recommended this drug by Jane Clark's sales team. They're being told it's low risk of abusive and addictiveness. And they feel confident in what they are being told and decide to prescribe it to the patients. And Purdue Pharma is reaping other benefits financially, so it's honestly working for them. But in all honesty, it's a money game. The money talks at the end of the day. But they are pushing a narrative to the sales representatives and to help the doctors and physicians to feel more confident prescribing oxycodone to their patients without the risk of addictiveness. Um, so, based on the case, you can see that it's evidence that sales team believes that the information they're being given is accurate. Um, however, we think that Clark should do further research, um, extending out to um, consultant groups just to identify some, whether or not the data is correct. Um, we're basing this on the principle of utilitarianism and autonomy. Um, utilitarianism in the sense of it providing the overall better value towards patients um, as it can lead to abuse and addiction. Um, there's a lot of information that is led to be believed, but it's not necessarily accurate. Um, so extensive research needs to be done to verify this information. And some may argue that utilitarianism is pushed in the other direction of creating um, beneficial wealth for the families, as well as the economy itself. But from a long-term perspective, um, this is going to actually create worse harm towards the patients. And then on the basis of autonomy, um, some may argue that autonomy is actually had because they're the ones making the decisions to market in the way that they want to. But this isn't exactly the case as not all the information is commonly given. Um, they're given false information. Um, they're also, they also have tactics used on them that are aggressive. Um, just pretty much a bunch of lies being fed to them. So the purpose of autonomy is not fully given as the information is not correct. And some people may argue that autonomy can then be received on an individual by doing research themselves. But they may not necessarily be in a position to do that research. They aren't doctors themselves. So even if they were to conduct research on their own standpoint, it wouldn't necessarily be as conducive as a professional. So we based this on utilitarianism, based on the main stakeholders, Purdue Pharma, Clark, the sales team, and the patients. Um, so when we, when we thought about that, we also looked at autonomy for that principle, because autonomy wasn't met, it wasn't brought to the attention of the patients. So that is false information. And from utilitarianism, it's not benefiting to the, the overall community. So in this case, the population. So that's why we chose utilitarianism. Um, we did look at uh, egoism as also another approach, but egoism is for the benefit for yourself and your individual self. So we looked at it for the Purdue Pharma for their benefit and the money gain and the sales team for the incentives that they received for the benefits like the, the bonuses. So, um, but those were the two approaches that we looked at and we ultimately decided to use the utilitarianism as that full approach.
you. And I'll team two. Um, to begin their presentation. This case refers to Jane Clark, who is the sales manager at Purdue Pharma. In order to increase profits and downplay the addictiveness of Oxycontin, Purdue Pharma officers instructed Clark to train her team on pseudo addiction. Pseudo addiction refers to the how patients are undertreated and actually need more chronic pain medication. Clark is given no evidence to support these claims, and she rather assumes the accuracy of it. After training her team, she gets lots of financial benefit, both her and her team does. But after seeing the rising addiction rates of Oxycontin, she begins to become worried about Purdue Pharma's role in the epidemic. Some stakeholders in this case are Jane Clark, her sales team, Purdue Pharma officers, and the patients being prescribed Oxycontin. Now I'll hand it over for the question. So the moral question of this case is should Jane Clark continue working for Purdue Pharma and meet her requirements of training her sales team to sell large amounts of OxyContin, making claims of pseudo addiction to increase dos dosages, all while receiving financial incentives to do so, or should Jane Clark stop training her team to meet these requirements without any data-driven evidence supporting the claims that they're being told to make about pseudo addiction? So for our argument, we argue that Clark should not outright leave the company um, since she does have to consider if she's providing for her family, for herself, but her mission and responsibility needs to seek other information about OxyContin um, and the drug that she's um, kind of marketing as the sales manager. So we suggest that she meets with her bosses um, or direct supervisor and request a study to be completed by an outsider, a third party, um, to do an independent study on if there is a connection between OxyContin Purdue Pharma and their marketing tactics in the drug itself and the addiction levels um, with their customers. Um, if they react in a dismissive manner, um, then we think it is right for Clark to leave. But if they are open, approachable, and say yes to this request, we believe that she should stay with the company in the meantime and hopefully see what those results are. All right. The ethical vacuum of this argument is due to notarian, which is doing the most good for most of our people. Uh, we believe that the patients' lives should be put over the profits of Purdue Pharma and their employers. Purdue has an ethics code saying that themselves as well as their employees should do whatever they can to fight opioid addiction and abuse rates. Um, and here, transparency is really the key. With the sales manager talking to um, Purdue and questioning what their marketing comes from in their data, um, she's doing whatever she has to do for her job in order to ensure that they are clear and transparent and making sure that she's doing what's right for the most amount of people. If she follows up, the marketing team and they don't get the data that she needs, she has an ethical right to leave the company and do what's best for the most amount of people because she's protecting lives and um, Purdue is not being transparent in their ethical code. If um, they aren't transparent with her and don't give her the research and she continues to stay with them, she also has a reason to leave because it would reflect badly on her and her uh, image and she would not be virtuous because she's not doing what she's signed up to do with uh, in terms of ethics. So by her leaving the company, she's saving the most amount of, uh, she's doing what's good for the most amount of people because she's saving lives as opposed to putting her own profit first. Another issue to consider in this is integrity. Purdue Pharma actually has a code of ethics that the entire staff is required to know and refer to throughout all of their work. And so honestly, if she doesn't um, bring up concerns, she isn't fulfilling her role as a Purdue Pharma employee. Um, some objections to our um, position could be that Clark, by raising concerns, could prevent patients who are in legitimate need of pain management solutions from having access to OxyContin. And we considered this and decided that um, OxyContin's hole in the market, its removal from the market, um, would not be significant enough for Ms. Clark to consider it in her decision here. There are plenty of other pain management solutions on the market from Tylenol to morphine, and that doesn't even consider acupuncture and other types of um, healthcare. Um, so we don't believe that that should be a concern to her. Secondly, um, we have to consider that Ms. Clark has a duty to herself and her family to bring in an income. Um, but as Gavin said, under utilita this utilitarianism principle, um, this does not have much weight because Ms. Clark bringing up concerns can prevent addiction and death for hundreds of patients. Um, additionally, she works at this time for a very respected company. 
um, we can assume that she has a bolstered resume. She is doing a great job at her company, um, making so many sales. And it's very likely that if she does choose to leave the company in the end, she will not have a difficult time finding employee, employee, employers. <laughs> so to conclude, we believe that Jane Clark should I have to stop you there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Churches, you have got two minutes to uh, look at questions, and then we begin with the question to team number eight. Uh, this could be for both teams. Oh, we have two minutes. You got two minutes. <laughs> so I just wanted to lower the code in silence <laughs> for us to discuss. We have a question for Team A. Um, just think about what is the obligation, it's a compound complex question. Isn't that what's the obligation of Clark's family? I mean, should, should she do anything? Isn't it, isn't it above her pay grade? Why not egotism? Egotism. You can use denotology. Okay, you've got a couple of minutes to prepare the answer. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. So what's the obligation of Clark's family?
thank you for your question. Um, looking at the situation, it seems to me like in that situation, it would be on the basis of close proximity, which is when you're saying that there's a priority towards yourself and those that are closely around you more so than someone else that you may not have a close association with. But I think within the studies of ethics, you're to look beyond that of what is your initial priority as to look at everyone as a whole and to make conclusions that can be used in every situation. And I think um, on the basis of utilitarianism and autonomy, um, it goes beyond just the close proximity. And even if you wanted to include the ontology, um, like the group said, they do have a civil duty as an employee to act with integrity. Um, I think if they also want to consider their family, um, you don't necessarily know the unintended consequences that could occur later on in terms of lawsuits, so they may be better they may be better off just stepping away from that for the time being rather than risking their wealth that they have at this moment, um, just being honest. And um, if they choose to stay within the company at this time, they could potentially face a bigger lawsuit, which could cause harm to the family. Thank you. Question for team B. Yes, I'm asking the question for team B. Uh, all right, we're, we're looking at this, and although you suggest if the company doesn't come forward to do the independent study, the transparency that she should be, how should she weigh the fact they'll get someone else in the beautiful center? Is there any obligation for that knowledge that someone's going to, on her part, that someone's going to come in and do the exact same thing. Fluence, that is, can she do more good from the inside than the outside? Two minutes. Team B, are you ready? We are. Thank you for your question, judges. Um, it is an unfortunate fact that financial pressure um, kind of has us all under its thumb, right? There's not a lot we can do when we're tied financially um, to a business in the way that um, Ms. Clark is in this scenario. Um, she can only control her own moral convictions, and so someone else coming in isn't really um, her ethical duty, right? Like all she can do is know her own convictions, know what she believes in, and do what is right and in her mind. And so somebody else coming in to fill her position isn't an ethical um, issue for Ms. Clark, right? That's the, that's the business that she works for. Um, 
On the second hand, we know that the Sacklers are very harsh. Um, Richard Sackler, the VP for marketing, is quoted at the actual OxyContin launch party as saying that he hopes there are a blizzard of prescriptions that will bury the competition. So from the very beginning, he was worried about sales and not worrying about health. So Ms. Clark underperforming, if she um, chooses not to train her employees but stay, um, she'll be fired in a heartbeat, which isn't exactly something um, that will help the case anyway. So that, so that being said, we believe that if she removes herself from the financial uh, ties from Purdue Pharma, that she will have more freedom to pursue justice. Maybe she can get in contact with the FDA um, because she doesn't have that contractual um, ties to Purdue Pharma anymore. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, teams A and B. Uh, it can go back to your places, please. And I can ask already teams C and D to the So we now have teams uh, C and D in place, and we move on to our uh, to round number two. And this is the case that we are considering over here. Dr. Alana Smith, a respected pain management specialist with 25 years of experience, is contacted by a sales rep from Purdue Pharma. The rep wants to set up a meeting to discuss OxyContin. Smith is aware that OxyContin is one of the most frequently prescribed opioids for managing severe chronic pain. However, she has read reports that raise serious concerns about patients abusing and becoming addicted to these powerful opioids. Although initially reluctant to meet with the rep, Smith eventually agrees. At that meeting, the rep assures Smith that OxyContin is not only safe and effective, but is far less likely to cause addiction than any other opioids on the market because it uses a patented slow release formula. Sensing Smith's skepticism, the rep offers to sponsor her at an upcoming conference on the use of OxyContin in pain management. Smith decides to attend the conference where she learns more about the drug's benefits. She also learns that Purdue is offering significant financial incentives for doctors who prescribe OxyContin. After further consideration, Smith decides to prescribe the drug for patients. With only a fairly short period of time, Smith notices that some of her patients taking OxyContin are exhibiting signs of addiction. Along with renewed concerns about the drug safety, Smith feels conflicted about the financial incentives she received from Purdue Pharma. In a meeting with the rep, Smith is told that her patients are most likely exhibiting pseudo addiction, meaning that they are actually being undertreated for pain and need a higher dosage of the drug. The question is, what should Smith do? Two minutes to confirm among yourself. One minute. I'm sorry, this is one minute only.
Are you ready, Team C? Dr. Alana Smith, she had already had her own um, personal beliefs, her own concerns, and when she met with the sales rep, the sales rep was able to completely change her mind and um, get her to prescribe the drug for her patients. So whether or not that was the correct decision isn't really the key focus. The key focus is what she should do now after she has um, prescribed this drug. So the way we looked at this, um, you know, the decision, she's already feeling the consequences of her mind being changed by, um, by the sales rep. So she's already starting to feel these consequences and this is something that we are weighing on her and um, her overall concerns, um, especially related to pseudo addiction, she definitely already had her, had those concerns and now they're even more heightened. So it's important uh, to look at what the right decision is and how, and um, also the different stakeholders involved in this case as a whole, in which um, we'll talk about. The major stakeholders that we did find were Dr. Smith herself, her patients, the office that she practices at, and the sales rep that initially sold her to the Octagon. Um, as for some morals that can be applied to the case, um, Kantian ethics can be looked at because we can infer that um, Dr. Smith, considering she has 25 years of experience, um, that she knows um, the severity of addiction and um, she knows that, she would know that there is risk when handing out uh, pain medications to people and Kant focuses on, his theories focus on uh, the right and wrongs of actual decisions and tying in with that experience, she would know that if she's feeling a certain way about uh, the Oxycontin and its signs of addiction, then she would be in the wrong for prescribing that to her patients, knowing what it can do to them. So according to the fact, she concerned the opioid managing and the uh, negative, have a negative impression on the Oxycontin but attending the meeting and learn, uh, learn about the uh, advantage of the discounting and then change her mind. So that she decided to prescribe to the drug. Also that she received a financial incentive. It means that she couldn't make fair judgment of the discounting uh, location. So um, after looking at the fact that she was, even with these financial incentives, uh, we believe that what she should do is um, stop prescribing uh, the Oxycontin. Um, we believe that you know, she wasn't, she definitely had her mind changed. There was a lot of different, there was incentives. There was a, a lot of decisions that had to be made. And uh, the sales rep gave her a lot of different incentives to do that. But after more consideration um, and seeing that some of her patients are already uh, experiencing these, this addiction, we believe that she should um, stop giving uh, Oxycontin to her patients. Thank you. Thank you. Now, she did present. We have five minutes. Um, Dr. Alana Smith is a pain specialist who has been approached by a sales rep um, from Purdue Pharma. Um, she wants to have a meeting about her. Uh, prescribing oxycodone um, to patients. Um, Smith is very skeptical about this um, due to all the bad reports that she's heard about this drug. Um, however, the sales rep is insistent um, on trying to get her to prescribe them, so she sponsors her at a conference about oxycodone um, and reassures her that it's a safe and effective drug due to the slow release formula that it has. Um, after attending the um, conference, Smith has learned a bit more information about it um, and about the drug benefits, um, as well as the money incentive for it. So then she decides to prescribe it to her patients. 
um, within a short period of time after prescribing it, she slowly regrets her decision due to um, the knowledge that some of her patients are becoming quite addictive to um, oxycodone. Um, so the sales rep then has a meeting with Smith and it just tells her that her patients are actually being undertreated for pain instead of the being addicted to the drug. Back to the case being stated, the stakeholders that represent, are represented in this case are Dr. Smith, who is uh, prescribing the drug, along with Dr. Pharma, who is making the drug, and of course, the sales rep for preventive surge prescribed the drug, and the patients who take these drugs, along with the families that are affected by it. We believe that Dr. Alana Smith, uh, going forward, should look to her own moral code and seek out deontological principles that are the basis of a good ethical foundation. Uh, three of these principles are honesty, integrity, and respect for others. By going through and using this drug and then seeing that it is having an effect that she believes to be addictive, she has an obligation to investigate the possibilities. While the sales representative assures her it is not addiction, but is in fact pseudo-addiction, she has not received any verifiable proof that that is the case. Um, and she has the duty to be to have integrity to her own job and to the people that she is responsible for and investigate this. She also has a duty of respect to her patients and should make sure that they are receiving the best care possible and not be exposing them to harm as a healthcare provider. Additionally, she has the duty to be honest and should she find after investigating that this drug is in fact harmful and addictive, she has a duty to be honest to her patients and explain to them, as well as taking them off the drug, the dr that the drug oxycodone is addictive. As, as mentioned by the specimen here, we are fully supporting our claim under the concepts under the ethical theory of deontology. Unlike other ethical theories, moral obligations on a universal basis are provided by deontology, similar to that of laws of science and mathematics. There's clear definition with this theory on what is morally wrong. Alana, with aligning her judgment with moral duties, which is skepticism, she has, she has to align this with the concepts of not lying. In doing so, she must be completely transparent, as Spencer mentioned, to her patients. She is to not harm others, and also to not treat others as means to an end, especially financially, since she is aware of the financial benefits that come with prescribing more drugs. If she is to take advantage of these financial benefits, she would be treating her patients as if they were things to obtain her needs. She, by making these decisions and carrying out these processes, she's exercising her equal and autonomic right to decision making and judgment by choosing to alert her patients. And she does this with goodwill and good judgment as it aligns with the moral duty.
right, so this question is for uh, TMC. Um, so before ask, you know, before Alana decides what she needs to do, um, how do you expect her to um, decide what to do without investigating uh, what, whether or not this is pseudo addiction? Ready? Yep. Okay. So, um, to answer your question about how, how Alana should decide what to do about having to further investigate this pseudo-addiction, um, we can infer from this case, because she has uh, 25 year, years of experience, that based on her background, um, she should at least have the skill set to kind of make decisions on her own, to a sense. Um, especially regarding medications that are being prescribed. Um, she already had prior concern about uh, the potential addictiveness of the uh, Oxycontin. And so before that meeting, she definitely already like um, knew that there could be consequences. And also within that meeting, um, we can infer that the sales rep is kind of extremely self-interested in a way. Every time that she, that, uh, the sales rep sensed that there was skepticism from Dr. Smith. The sales rep would always um, try to uh, basically lie just to get her to change her mind and prescribe the drug. So just going off of everything, um, she should be able to decide that it's not worth um, all these lives and all these addictions uh, just for this financial incentive. Um, and that goes with cots. Um, categorical imperatives, which are equality and respect for her fellow human beings. Um, she's using the financial incentives instead of, she's using financial incentives in place of her respect and her uh, 25 years of experience. And she's not really considering uh, her reputation. And the moral value of her of herself depends on the intentions that she has. Thank you. <laughs> yes, right. I have a question. You identified stakeholders. You did not identify 
said, living this oxycontin. Why did you consider the public? And if you do consider the public, what is their interest? Basic question, why did you consider the public as a state? Indeed, are you ready? Yes, we're okay. Go ahead. All right. Uh, to answer your question, judges, um, so as we stated at the beginning, uh, we did extend our considerations to the families and loved ones of those affected by oxycontin and opioid addiction. And we believe that by addressing them, that also applies to anyone they may, you know, also feel for. So while it may not uh, necessarily extend to every single member of the public, because every single member of the public does not necessarily deal firsthand or secondhand uh, with opioid addiction. By that we mean meeting someone or having to address or interact with someone who's currently suffering from opioid addiction. We do believe that the families and loved ones of those who are affected um, are part of our considerations. Uh, however, uh, Dr. Alana Smith uh, is more, should be prioritizing her moral duties uh, by following moral law, and by doing so, uh, should still focus on the honest, on being honest and integritous to her own patients. Okay, that's last. We also discussed earlier. We also mentioned earlier that deontology is a universal principle that can directly and definitively say what is morally wrong. With that being said, all individuals involved have a duty not to lie and not to harm others. This applies and extends to everybody, whether it be stakeholders, the public, whatnot. Thank you. Thank you. We now take a couple of minutes to, our, uh, to announce the winners from round one and round two.
So the winners from round one and two, uh, eight forward. Team B and Team D, please. And while you're doing that, in the in the interest of time, I already read case number three. The final one that you have to consider. The Sackler family, who owned and operated Purdue Pharma, have faced numerous lawsuits and accusations relating to their role in the opioid crisis, uh, epidemic. This case has given rise to sharp disagreements as to who ultimately bears the moral responsibility for the damage caused by the drug OxyContin. Andrea, a college uh, journalist, has recently published a piece about Purdue Pharma uh, by the Purdue Pharma scandal in her column, Taking Sides. In the column, Andrea does something surprising. She comes to the defense of the Sackler family. While she acknowledged that the Sacklers were certainly guilty of misleading the public about the dangers of OxyContin, the moral responsibility for problems associated with this use lies with the patients and their doctors. Patients assumed responsibility when they chose to use the opioid prescribed to them, knowing that drugs have potentially dangerous side effects. Doctors who prescribed the drug assumed responsibility for closely monitoring their patients for signs of abuse or addiction. Andrea is careful to note that she isn't taking this position just to be controversial adding that she lost a close relative to the opioid addiction. My point, she concludes, is simply this. If there is a safe way to use a powerful painkiller like OxyContin, then any responsibility for its misuse must be placed at the user end. Okay, so I'm asking you to consider this question. Based on your analysis of the case, do you agree or disagree with Andrea's decision? And explain your position carefully. Thank you. You have one minute to consider. Team B, can I ask you to start your presentation? You've got five minutes. So this case refers to Andrea, who is a college journalist, who in her column, Taking Sides, indicated that she believes that the Sacklers are guilty of misleading the public due to their false marketing. But she believes that it was the patient's and the doctor's fault for the increased addiction numbers. She believes that if there was a safe way to use OxyContin, then they should find a way. She also has a, had her own experience with addiction. That, coupled with the fact that this was a college opinion piece, we can infer that there was no real outside influence and this is purely her opinion. Some stakeholders in this case are Andrea, the Sackler family, the patients being prescribed OxyContin, the doctors prescribing it, and the readers of the article. So moving on to our moral question, our group has decided that 
Yes. The moral question, is Andrea correct in saying that the moral responsibility of the opioid crisis lies upon patients and their prescribing doctors? Our decision to this is while we sympathize with Andrea, as we understand she has been personally impacted by this crisis with the loss of a loved one, we disagree with Andrea's claim that the moral responsibility lies on patients and their prescribing doctors based on the principles of establishing truth, moderation, and maintaining integrity. So for our argument, we use the principle of truth as one of the pieces of our framework. And Andrea's piece assumes that doctors and patients had access to reliable and accurate information about OxyContin, um, but that is not the case. As Purdue Pharma purposely misled with conferences that posed as medical but were actually promotional, um, medical journal advertisements that included outdated um, scientific studies, and were purely marketing to doctors with misleading remarks about OxyContin. And also the Sackler family pushed their sales team to mislead um, the doctors that they were trying to help prescribe the medication using the term pseudo addiction, which is a diagnosis that has no empirical evidence. So altogether that shows that through the misleading, um, that was on the end of the Sackler family and Purdue Pharma and not on the doctors and the patients. Aristotle's virtue ethics describe a virtuous life as one marked by moderation. This doctrine of the mean says that for every decision, there is a middle ground between the two vices on either side. So take for example, the desire for wealth. If someone is in deficiency of this desire, they have no ability to be independent and support themselves, but if someone is in excess of this desire, they will become rapacious and willing to hurt anybody necessary in order to accumulate fortune. And that is exactly what we see in the case of the Sackler family and Purdue Pharma. As I described in our last case, the Sacklers were concerned with money from the very beginning. Um, the goal of OxyContin, even at its launch party, um, wasn't to save lives, it was to make money. Um, moving on to integrity, um, we can define integrity as remaining steadfast to one's moral convictions even when it becomes difficult. Purdue Pharma very, very publicly committed themselves to a strong morality in their code of ethics. Um, on the very first page of this code of ethics, Purdue Pharma establishes itself as an important stakeholder in pain management and as such commits themselves to um, fighting overuse and overprescription of opioids, which we know to be entirely untrue. Um, our team does not believe that we can fault um, doctors and patients all over the country for falling victim to this facade. Andrea's main argument is that uh, if there's a safe way to get the drug, then the responsibility must fall on the patients and doctors. However, this argument can come into play because there is uh, no safe way to actually get the drug. As we've shown, Purdue Pharma has built a, an empire basically of lies. Um, so the doctors, even though they um, were supposed to be, or even though they had a responsibility to look out for their patients, they did do that. They went through and they brought up what their concerns were to Purdue Pharma and their marketing team, their sales reps, and were told constantly that pseudo addiction was the reason and then they should prescribe more pills. Uh, because of this, um, the doctors and patients uh, were led to trust Purdue. And at the same time, these doctors and patients don't, they have full-time jobs. They are working people. They don't have the resources that Purdue Pharma has to do the research necessary to see if these drugs are actually good for patients or not. Purdue Pharma should be trusted, or is supposed to be trusted, because they have an entire sales team and marketing team, and they have research teams that are full-time employees that's, whose main job is to check for the safety of these drugs. At the same time, the entire system, while being faulty, was supposed to be trusted along with the FDA. Um, people assume that, oh, Purdue Pharma is following the laws that the FDA has set forth, which means that they can be trusted. But if both Purdue Pharma and the FDA have both failed, it should not be the fault of the patients and the doctors in order to uh, decide like, whether or not they should be taking the drugs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Team Deep Niche. The Sackler family um, are the owners of Purdue Pharma and have been facing multiple lawsuits and accusations towards the opioid epidemic. However, there is this big question that has been asked frequently about who takes the moral responsibility. Um, a college student, um, Andrea, wrote a poem about the situation um, defending the Sackler family, um, which is quite surprising due to her having um, her having a family member who passed away due to um, oxygen. Um, 
she believes that um, it's the patient's and the doctor's fault. However, this is her own opinion with no outside views. That being said, the people and groups directed at the uh, stakeholders in this case are Andrea, a uh, college journalist who wrote the article, called it to Pharma, who uh, made the drug, and the Sackler family that owns the company, along with the patients and families uh, who have taken the drug and been affected by it, with the, the doctors prescribing the drug to them and the public as a whole. Looking at Andrea's claims that doctors and patients are the ones who bear the responsibility for the misuse of the drug, we believe this claim is not in line with our beliefs uh, as a moral standard. The first reason we disagree with this is that had the Sacklers not acted in the immoral way that they had, disrespecting the autonomy, integrity, and honesty of their own company and of the individuals they are providing to, none of the doctors would have been faced with the situation of just prescribing a potentially harmful or unknowingly prescribing a potentially harmful drug. Additionally, these actions committed by Purdue Pharma, the misleading of the public, the misleading of health professionals, and the falsification of research data were all done with unjust intentions. They are, without a doubt, moral infringements on the idea of honesty. Additionally, looking at the patients who were affected by this, all those who took Oxycontin, they were, in fact, not able to think in a completely comprehensive manner, as most people suffering from addiction tend to have a very large, a very incredibly augmented or disfigured way of thinking as addiction can sorry, addiction can greatly impact the way one thinks, one acts, and how they interpret the world around them. To say that these people were in complete and full control of their actions and minds is a stretch at best. Additionally, the distribution of a drug of the drug Oxycontin made by Purdue Pharma was allowed by groups like the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, as well as the American Medical Association. Both of these groups have a great deal of influence on hospitals, pharmacists, and other distributors of healthcare and healthcare providers. The fact that these two groups did not oversee properly the distribution and proper research and background of the drug shows that the doctors were not at fault, as they have responsibilities to obey the laws and regulations set forth by these two groups. so many situations with faults and more than that at hand that we can only hope to turn to a solution to find who is responsible and what can be done to write to write this and grow towards a morally just society. The ontology gives a definitive answer on what moral behaviors are inherently wrong and will help us in the direction of justice. It is here we turn to blame the Sackler family, as Spencer mentioned, and we rely on major principles of deontology involving moral obligation not to lie as the Sackler as the Sacklers did not align their principles within the entirety of the company, and naturally as the leaders of the company, they hold more responsibility to do so. They also have violated principles such as not doing harm onto, not doing issues onto others that they would not want done onto them, as clearly if the situation was flip-flops and they were the victims, they would not like to be lied to and um, not giving correct information. They also have more of moral obligations to not harm individuals, and they have viol and they have violated this by mismarketing the drugs. And they have treated users and they have treated patients and other individuals as means to an end by only sourcing for revenue and promotion to be able to obtain their needs. Thank you very much.
So this question is for Team B. Uh, so in your response, and, uh, and obviously you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you lay uh, nearly 100% of the blame on the sacrament, and very little to none on the doctors and the patients. Uh, where would you, would you see the doctors um, needed to be being faithful to the Hippocratic Oath and to uh, you know, first do no harm, and the um, the responsibility to have a, a healthy professional skepticism um, in that position. Team, are you ready? Yes. Yep. Go ahead. So our, to answer your question, um, the doctors did believe that while prescribing OxyContin, that they were following the oath they took as, as doctors. Um, they were approached by Purdue Pharma, and they were um, led to believe that OxyContin was FDA and MA approved, which the drug was. Um, however, when they were approached um, by Purdue Pharma, they were shown promotional videos um, for OxyContin with actors posed as researchers and doctors paid by Purdue Pharma, the company itself, in um, you know the video promotions showed to the doctors. So they were given false information um, and shown false information in these videos. And they believed that these people were credible resources, but they were actually actors posing as researchers and doctors giving them this incorrect information. And again, it was hired by Purdue Pharma. And of course, doctors and patients should have some level of um, skepticism. But of course, when you're told by all the experts, by government officials, by regulators, by that whole mix, um, that, the, that this drug is perfectly fine and okay, um, of course, they would go that direction until they learn something else. And especially in this case, with the pressure of the Sackler family on the sales team and Purdue company as a whole in their marketing tactics with their promotional conferences, that were posed to professionals as completely medicine-based and scientific-based. Um, altogether, those misleading, those misleading factors um, played a significant role in how the doctors and patients responded to this crisis. At the same time, the skepticism that they had, they did voice their concerns to Purdue, uh, but they were met with the same argument that it's pseudo-addiction and they should prescribe the drug. So again, they were given that wrong information by Purdue Pharma itself, and 
they were led to believe that that was correct in what they were saying. So they cannot be held helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Under the facts of these, this, this case, when, in your mind, was there a tipping point for the doctor to question the FDA and the AMA? If there was, I don't know. But do you see in these set of facts a tipping point where the doctor should have said, this ain't right? the system that they're provided, the system of information provided by Purdue Pharma, the AMA, FDA, and all other sources of information to their profession. The point at which they can no longer trust these sources that they have been given to listen to through their entire professional career will be the point at which they're in their own good moral conscience. They can no longer determine that what they are doing is in accordance with their moral law and obligations as a medical profession. To expand on this, the point where they believe they are no longer doing no harm or doing as minimal harm as possible would be the point in which they would have to decide whether they are going to be a moral actor and give up on using Oxycontin or be an immoral actor and continue to use it. To bring up the moral background behind all of this, Khan specifically exercises or states the importance of critical thinking individuals should utilize their right to judgment and decision making as moral beings and vehicles and hold themselves as more responsible and accountable. All individuals are entitled to their own decision making. To expand on that for just a minute more, they have come to believe in all their professional experience, experience that the resources and information provided to them by all of these regulators and professional groups should be trustworthy. At the time, the FDA and AMA gave generally helpful information. To believe that in this one instance that they were being given false information would require a general suspension of their belief system. To do that, they would have to then reach the point where they can no longer believe that everything brought before them was always 100% correct. To do this would mean they would have to extend their skepticism beyond the point they normally would for their organizations. Thank you. We now take a couple of minutes to deliberate over here.
niet in mijn hart. Ik snel niet. So this was a tremendous uh, event for all of you, uh, teams. Uh, I think that you did a lot of effort in here and uh, you made a wonderful uh, presentation. Audience, you also have to consider that these teams have been busy with uh, their uh, business, um, honorable business course and considered a lot of ethical theories. So, this is a tremendous effort for them. Uh, I commend you all for your effort here. I'm thanking the judge also for the effort uh, to uh, take and uh, look at this case over here. And I now, I, I now announce the winner, and that is Team B. Thank you very much. all so much for coming this is a great turnout and as it should be because i think she has some really great things to talk about so welcome gabriella please take the stage hello everyone um i'm gabriella livieri i am the community engagement and environmental justice manager at elizabeth river project i actually graduated from virginia wesley in 2021 with a degree in sustainability management so i'm happy to be here um, this year's conference theme is a greener tomorrow. Before we begin, I'd like to hear from you. So if someone would like to share what a greener tomorrow means to you. And then no reliance on fossil fuels. Nice. And, and your name and major? Uh, I'm John. I'm a business major. Thanks, John. Anyone else? Dr. Haley, what does a greener tomorrow mean to you? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. It was just my chance to call on him. Ensuring our actions today will generations. Thank you. And your name and major? Nice. Okay, anyone else want to share? Abby. Wonderful. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, so I'm not sure I brought enough, but I did bring a handout. Sorry, y'all. This clicker doesn't like me. Okay. So um, this handout is actually from Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. Uh, the point of this Venn diagram is to figure out where you fit in this huge concept for a greener tomorrow. So you'll fill out what brings you joy, what you're good at, and what needs doing. And somewhere in the middle, it'll give you a roadmap to figure out how you fit into this big picture. And you can do this um, throughout the presentation if you like, or you can do it whenever you are ready to ponder what that is. Just to tell you a little bit about Elizabeth River Project, we are community members, businesses, schools, and government organizations working to restore our home river. When our work began 30 years ago around the kitchen table, the river was presumed dead. Now the eastern branch of the Elizabeth River is fully restored for oysters, bald eagles, dolphins, seahorses, river otters, and brown pelicans are a common sight along our river. Through community partnerships, restoration, and education programs, we are healing the Elizabeth River. Okay, for some EES students, pop quiz. How many gallons of water can a single oyster filter in a day? A lot. <laughs> I like that answer. Okay, anyone? So about 50 gallons, but I like, I like the enthusiasm, I like a lot. Uh, historically, oysters could filter the entire Chesapeake Bay's um, entire water volume in less than one week. So when we say fully restored for oysters, that's what we're talking about.
Today, somewhere along the Elizabeth River, school kids will discover something new and squirmy. Someone will tend to their backyard garden filled with oysters, or paddle through a restored wetland once filled with pollution. Over the past 30 years, the Elizabeth River Project has come a long way toward restoring our hometown river, but we've still got a long way to go. Help us create a clean, healthy river for everyone. Do something beautiful. Join the Elizabeth River Project today. So um, our governing principles are under the Watershed Action Plan, which is a partnership-driven roadmap to clean the river. It identifies five key objectives and a strategy for community-wide action to restore the Elizabeth. Okay, action one. Achieve fair and equitable restoration of the Elizabeth River, reducing unfair pollution burdens and advancing community-wide engagement. Action two, collaborate, collaborate regionally to become a model for resilience to rising sea levels and a changing climate. Support this with strong research examples and policies. Our Ryan Resilience Lab, which opens October of this year, is an ex extension of that action. The Louis and Prue Ryan Resilience Lab of the Elizabeth River Project will serve as a global model for urban coastal living that protects both the ecosystem and humans as sea levels rise. The green features are not the best that money can buy, but that's purposeful. It makes it accessible, sustainable for, um, for communities, homeowners, and businesses big and small, so it's easy, it's easy to replicate. Action three, restore clean water. Reduce nutrients, chemicals, and harmful bacteria and improve water clarity in the river with a focus on reducing pollution in underserved communities and those vulnerable to rising seas. Action four, create an inclusive river revolution led by people of all ages and walks of life who understand, embrace, and promote the restoration of the Elizabeth. Action five, the goo must go. Clean up contamination in the river bottom while also reducing PCBs in fish. Our River Star Businesses program is one of the avenues we use to implement this plan. The Elizabeth River has been an important harbor and port for centuries. Its watershed is home to the largest naval base and the world's and the nation's oldest shipyard. The free program has 148 participating businesses, which are recognized as organizations that voluntarily reduce pollution and or create and conserve wildlife habitat. And here we have our stellar results since the program's inception in 1997. We have created or restored 20, uh, 2,448 acres. We've reduced pollution by 370 million pounds, I'm supposed to say million pounds, and uh, reduced waste by 1 billion pounds. The, these businesses are recognized in Inside Business, the Hampton Roads Business Journal, as well as our River Star Luncheon every year. Actually, a Virginia Wesleyan was honored earlier this year, but I will get into that in a moment. In highlighting a couple of our River Star businesses, I'm including the Port of Virginia since they kicked off this week. The Port of Virginia is the Commonwealth's leading agency for international transportation and maritime commerce and is, is responsible for operating and marketing the marine terminal facilities through which shipping trade takes place. Port of Virginia operates three ports in the, uh, ports in the Elizabeth River watershed. 
It is ISO 14001, which is an internationally agreed standard that sets out the requirements for an environmental management system. It helps organizations improve environmental performance through more efficient use of resources and reduction of waste, gaining a competitive advantage and the trust of stakeholders. Lady Fern Native Plants is a powerhouse small business in Norfolk. Lady Fern sells North American native trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants, primarily native to Southeast Virginia. The business is currently operated by Nicole with help from her husband, but does not have any other employees. So it's just the two of them. Most impressively from their efforts, they installed a thousand gallon cistern on a giant upcycled spool to the water collection system to bring the rain storage up to 1800 gallons. Water use is high for the potted plant inventory and this system saved about 27,000 gallons of water in one year. As I mentioned, Virginia Wesleyan was honored earlier this year for advancing to model level, which is the highest level of the River Star Businesses Program. Together last year, Virginia Wesleyan and the Elizabeth River Project planted about 5,700 native plants and trees between Poplar Hall Park and Mains Creek. So in conclusion, there is room for everyone, including organizations, businesses big and small, individuals, to contribute to this collective action for a greener tomorrow. Thank you very much. Did anyone fill out their Venn diagram and have something they want to share? John? Which aspect, just the climate action bit? You can share what you love, what you think you're good at, or you can summarize the climate action for us. Well, uh, I'll just do all three base things, all four and the final. Uh, where it was joy, I like helping others. It makes my heart feel really nice. It's really cool. Uh, what am I good at? Uh, I'm good at general and political knowledge as well as maneuvering logistics to achieve those goals. And what he's doing is simply changing the economic framework that leads to a more that leads to people wanting to use sustainable actions, not just because it's sustainable, but because it's economically uh, the optimal solution. And uh, for climate action, uh, the way I put down is to pass a federal legislation to remove fossil fuel subsidies because that's like over a trillion dollars in subsidies. People complain about the deficit. I'm like, that's the easy thing to take out. You want to save money, federal government. And uh, because fossil fuel are basically buoyed up by so much subsidies, tax credits, and all those things, uh, removing them would, by nature, default them over to the sustainable form of energy, like nuclear, like solar, like wind, and all those different types of energy. So it sounds like these actions are something you'd like to roll into your career, is that correct? I believe it would be a good thing for everyone as a whole, so that would be ideal, yeah. What would be your dream job in order to tackle that? Anywhere that massively influences public policy and just to make politics the only way that you can do that by making sure that you have the initiative there. But that's so bogged down with inefficiencies, I can't even begin to count how many. So it's a convoluted position with everything working against each other. So the best solution would just be to sign your fingers and have it happen, but government doesn't work that way. So there's no other way to do it. Nothing works that way. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, John. Would anyone else like to share? Uh, you don't have to share your climate action, but you can share some of the things that you're, you're good at or what you love. Or does anybody want to answer the earlier question of what a greener tomorrow looks like to you? What was your name and major? Stefan. Stefan. Lovely. Thank you for sharing. And that's a great point. Um, a greener tomorrow really seems like an overwhelming concept. But hopefully, um, our actions and our example can show you that collaborative 
and um, collective action can make those things happen, right? In it's incremental, it's like John said, it's not a snap of your fingers, but what is, what is the alternative? To not do anything, right? <laughs> Would anyone else like to share? Maybe someone else from the conference group? Oh, sorry, I missed you. What's your name and major? Uh, my name is Phoebe, and I'm a history major with a music minor. But um, I guess just in thinking about a greener tomorrow, I like thinking about it in that collaborative sense. Because like, when you hear words like green, um, at least my mind automatically goes to like STEM and biology and EES, and like, I'm not involved in that. But like, seeing the example of the Elizabeth River Project and how like it's businesses coming together, schools with a bunch of different people from a bunch of different like academic backgrounds working together. I just like the collaboration of it. Thanks, Phoebe. And, and that's also part of the reason why I brought this Venn diagram. Um, it could give you a roadmap for a green career, but it could also show you how to fold green practices into whatever you pursue. Uh, our organization, even though it's an environmental nonprofit, it's not all just environmental uh, scientists. We have um, director of development. We have account managers. We have marketing managers. So it, sometimes all it takes is a passion. You love the environment, and you want to bring your skills and your talent to do something about it. Does anyone else have any questions? Yes, sir. So I'm not like, too familiar with this area. So like, where exactly is the Elizabeth River, and like, how actually large is it? Like, how much impact does it actually have? So the, the watershed of the Elizabeth River encompasses um, sections of Norfolk, Portsmouth, Chesapeake, and um, Virginia Beach. It, it opens into the Chesapeake Bay, so the Elizabeth River is a part of the Chesapeake Bay overall watershed. Um, there is a southern branch, a western branch, and an eastern branch. How many miles would be a good question that I can always follow up with, but it's, it's fairly large. It also connects to the uh, Lafayette River and a couple of creeks. Yes, ma'am. Well, I have a question. Um, how do you incentivize businesses with the Riverside program if it means that they have additional costs? So as, as our business program manager would say, we are a carrot and not a stick. Um, we've, we're not a regulatory agency. Uh, we emphasize on a collaborative model. And all of the businesses uh, in participating are voluntary. And what we do is we support them with their initiatives. We do site visits and consultant ways. We also find resources for them. Sometimes we buy plants. Um, I also handed out uh, a set of eco tips, and those are for businesses and small organizations, and it's organized by monetary investment and time investment. So it gives everyone some place to start. And some of these things you can do if, at home as well. So it, there are some added costs, but then sometimes there are instances where things like energy efficient appliances, they, they can save money. Sometimes it's a win-win-win for businesses, the environment, and um, collaboration overall. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So since you're a Virginia Wesleyan graduate, I thought maybe you might have some advice for the students here in terms of once they have their first job. Honestly, the biggest um, thing I learned is talking to people, right? Um, some folks get phone anxiety. Some folks have um, a hard time connecting with people. I know text is the primary and preferable uh, form of communi communication for younger generations. <laughs> but go out there, volunteer, network, and it's going to connect you to people. Um, Hampton Roads is a large area, but it, sometimes it functions as a small town, and you never realize how folks are connected. And sometimes someone that you know could lead you down a path to further what you want to do. I got my current job, uh, Dr. Gibson, who's retired, he was my advisor, and he introduced me to the person that I, rep I reported to at um, Elizabeth River Project. I started as a part-time seasonal person and then a part-time person as I was still in Virginia Wesleyan. And then I got a job offer to work full-time as a program specialist, and then I was promoted as the community engagement and 
uh, environmental justice manager. So before you know it, when you invest in these relationships, you'll be farther in your career than you realize. Yes, ma'am. I think that points back to uh, this overwhelming uh, urgency, right? Now there's, environmental justice is kind of a buzzword now, right? Even though it's been a movement for decades, since the 60s, it um, could also be called external civil rights. And it's along the same lines where there's this urgency to, to turn back time and change everything, right? And redress what has, um, what has been wrong. Um, it, is, it is overwhelming. There's actually resources for uh, climate anxiety. Uh, there's a website called All We Can Save, and that's actually where the Venn diagram comes from because there is this overwhelming sense of urgency. Um, but the, the burden is not just on one generation. It's, it's playing the long game. It's, it's connecting and investing and incremental change which is not always satisfying, but it's the work that needs to be done. Does that answer? Anything else? Yes. What are some of the initiatives you've already done? You talked about like with places you partnered with, you partnered with us, for instance. But uh, where were you inspired to make these specific actions? Did you draw from a different area or a different region? Or was it all like self-contained within the Elizabeth River Project's uh, employees? Um, it was self-contained. When they started the organization in the 90s, it was literally a couple of concerned citizens sitting around a kitchen table who decided to do something. The executive director, who was uh, one of the original founders, she actually left her career in, um, in journalism. She, I believe she was with the Virginia Pilot and became a waitress just to support um, her goals of starting this organization. And then here we are. I mean, we're still a small staff. We're 30 something folks. But we're now building an $8 million facility that's going to serve as a hub for resiliency and sustainable practices for community members, businesses, developers, X, Y, and Z. But where they originally started in cleaning up the river is they targeted larger maritime businesses, right? Because they had more of an impact on the river. And it just kind of branched out from there. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah, of course. Yes. Oh, I wish she hadn't left. Uh, Dr. Malcolm, oceanography was excellent. Um, Dr. GJ's uh, natural and social history of the Chesapeake Bay. Of course, Dr. Haley's GIS class. Um, <laughs> I was going to comment on the new software <laughs> and your feelings about it, but we'll move on. And then, of course, uh, marketing and um, environmental economics. Uh, sustainability management is a really rich uh, dynamic degree. But as you choose your electives and if you want greener pract practices in, in your career, um, I, would, I would look at the interesting electives that Virginia Wesleyan has. I mean, I took um, black horror fiction and that was, that was amazing. It even um, helped my creative writing as I'm writing copy for social media posts. So it's, it's taking a little bit of everything and applying it, if that makes sense. I think I saw another hand. What are some of the things that you and the ERP are doing to make this River Revolution truly inclusive? Ooh, so that's my job. Yeah. So what I'm so what I'm focusing on is so right now I'm working on an equity grant with NSU and it's to build an engagement model with vulnerable and underserved communities, and the most important thing I'm finding is building trust, 
right? Sometimes these communities have had institutions come in, do their research, and, and move on without any buy-in. So we have to build that trust, right? And it involves listening sessions. It, it requires empowerment, not just rolling up into a community and telling them what to do, oh, you need to plant these trees. We have to understand their needs before we can act. Um, some more concrete, uh, some more concrete uh, access would be equitable access to the river, um, green infrastructure, green spaces, how even walkability in green spaces not only applies economic justice, but also uh, fosters mental wellness, relieves stress, and just sort of this education how everything is connected and beneficial to them, right? If, if it's an underserved community and it's a low income community, some folks might feel like they have more important things to think about, but this is something that truly benefits them, and that's what we want to do and engage them and show them how this benefits them and give equitable access to the resources and services that we give them. And also uh, being inclusive in our internally in our organization, making sure there's representation in the marketing so people feel like this work and these spaces are for them. Where's, your, where's the new facility going to be? You showed the nice photo. It's going to be um, on North Collie, right on Knitting, uh, Knitting Mill Creek. So it'll have a nice view of the creek. Norfolk. Norfolk, yes. Yes, Norfolk. Any other questions? All right, thank you. I'll, I'll be hanging around in case anyone wants to talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you. Okay, can we get one more round of applause for her, please? That was so great. Okay, and that concludes today's session. Thank you guys all for coming, and I hope to see you guys tomorrow.